Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. Uh, in this episode, I am very excited to have once again Kevin Mitchell on the podcast. Uh, Kevin is Associate Professor of Genetics and Neuroscience at Trinity College Dublin. He has a bachelor's in the genetics department from Trinity College Dublin and also a PhD in neurobiology from University of California at Berkeley. His main research areas are on much of the genetics around the wiring of the brain and how it has impact on psychiatric neurological diseases. Um, he is also interested in the biology of agency and free will. Uh, he has been on the podcast previously. Uh, folks that are interested can listen to my two-hour conversation with Kevin. Uh, that's episode 59, Genetic Balancing of Nature and Nurture. And we talk all about uh, his previous book, uh, which is called Innate, How the Wiring of Our Brains Shapes Who We Are. Uh, it's a fabulous book. And uh, he has a, a new book out called Free Agents, uh, How Evolution Gave Us Free Will. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned in the conversation, I'm not a big believer in free will. Uh, obviously, Kevin is. Uh, but he has such an interesting way of discussing this. Um, I, I really like Kevin as a, as a person and we're quite friendly with each other. And so it was great because I, we, we could have a, you know, he knows me, I know him. We could have a spirited discussion on, on free will. And, and, uh, I, I did, uh, I think an appropriate amount of pushback with him on things. And I will say, um, he definitely gave me a lot to think about and pushed me closer to, you know, reconsidering some of my, uh, my own positions. Um, uh, I felt this way in the book. I felt this way in the conversation. He's such a lovely person and he's absolutely brilliant. So it was, it was wonderful to kind of get into all of the details with him about his book and his views on free will. We start by talking about why do we need biology and genetics to understand free will? Why, why do we have to have this evolutionary basis in it? Um, he gives some pretty good an answers for that. We talk about the different levels of determinism. We talk about reacting versus choosing at a cellular and molecular level. We talk about the choice there is with ion channels in the cell. We talk about dimensions of free will, vision and choice, decision-making and cortical levels of the brain, metacognition, personality theories, the notion of the self, AI and free will, and many other topics. Uh, again, um, I, I was so, uh, so had so much, uh, such a good time, and, and it was such an honor to, to have Kevin on again. Again, I've I enjoyed our first conversation. I loved his previous book. Uh, this one was was wonderful, and I really really enjoyed this this conversation. Which, again, two and a half hours uh, of his time and his energy, which I'm, I'm so deeply grateful. Um, as always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations over at my uh, Substack, uh, convergingdialogues.substack.com. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube, so get over there, uh, subscribe, follow, tell your friends, share widely. Uh, it's much appreciated. And uh, definitely go buy his book, Free Agents. And so, now I bring you Kevin Mitchell. I'm here with Kevin Mitchell. Uh, once again, Kevin, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. I'm uh, very happy to uh, to talk with you. Thanks, Xavier. Thanks a lot for having me again. It's my uh, yeah, pleasure. Absolutely. We uh, we talked last time. Oh, it's been a, a, at least two years. I think we were trying to yeah. figure out when it was. It's it's been a couple of years. You were kind of early on in the podcast, and we talked about your fabulous book, uh, Innate, which I which I really loved. I've I've actually used it in courses, um, oh, and I know other folks. To hear. Have, thanks. Yeah, other 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 colleagues and friends of mine have used it as well. So, it's a it's a fabulous book, and you have Cheers. the next one uh, that is just about to be uh, released. It is Free Agents: How Evolution Gave Us Free Will. Uh, you really just picked a boring topic to write about, Kevin. Yeah. There's just nothing interesting to say about free will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing controversial or nothing. challenging in there. No, not at, at all. all. Yeah. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Uh, so, for for listeners that don't know you or haven't listened to the previous conversation, just give us a small snapshot of who you are professionally, uh, uh, academically, and, and what you're currently up to. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm a um, associate professor of genetics and neuroscience at Trinity College in Dublin, and my 
research over the years has been in trying to understand how the brain develops. How, how does the brain get wired, how, you know, down to the sort of level of detail of how individual neurons know which direction they should project to and who they should connect to in the brain. So there's somehow in the, in the genome, all of that is, is encoded, some program for wiring the brain. And once you start thinking about that, it's, it becomes clear that actually a lot of um, differences that we may see in, say, people's behavioral traits or personality or intelligence or sexuality or all kinds of other aspects of who, you know, what makes us who we are mm -hmm. may come down to differences in the way our brains are wired. Or not completely, obviously, but maybe influenced by that. Um, and that's what, my, that's what my previous book, Innate, was about, was really trying to um, understand where some of those differences come from, uh, make the case that we're not born as blank slates, that first of all, we all have a human nature, right? That's different from chimps and tigers and so on, because we don't have chimp DNA or tiger DNA. We have human DNA, uh, but be also because there's variations in that DNA. And there's lots of variations in just the way the brain develops. Um, we each are born with a brain that's really wired s somewhat differently and can contribute to our individual natures. So um, that's what that book was about. And funnily enough, it kind of naturally led to this second one, partly because when people hear that, um, they say, wait, my, my personality is due to the way my brain is wired. And I didn't choose the way my brain is wired. So, mm. you know, it, in the moment here, my personality is affecting my decision making. So do I really have free will? Am I really in charge? Or am I just configured in a certain way? And I'm just sort of playing out my, my programming? Am I, am I just a kind of a, a, a neural robot or a meat puppet? Mm -hmm. And um, so partly that was one of the sort of um, instigators of me starting to think about this, this age-old topic of free will and, and trying to, um, you know, think what neuroscience and genetics and other aspects of biology could have to say about it. Mm. Yeah, no, that's... It's an important question, I think, because obviously many people have these discussions about free will. I'll have many conversations with people and I'll always sideline it because I know it's such a big kind of topic mm. and people have fought about it in uh, scientific circles and theological circles and uh, social circles. So it, it is something that comes up because there's a lot of importance uh, for yeah. it. So it's... Uh, yeah, there's a I, lot of... Um there's a lot at stake, right? I mean, it, cause yeah. it's tied to obviously the, the sort of things that follow from it. Mm -hmm. You know, if we think, well, I'm not really in charge. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm configured this way, but I didn't choose that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe even, uh, you know, everything that just happens is just physics playing out. You know, when you mm -hmm. get down to it, if you get to that sort of level of what's called determinism, the obvious sort of implication is that we can't praise or blame people for mm -hmm. their actions we're not in fact we're not really doing actions at all there's just things happen right mm -hmm. um and if that's true then our whole sort of system of moral responsibility on which not just our legal system but our whole um, social system is founded seems to crumble right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so you get a lot of the debates in philosophy that um are ostensibly about whether we could have free will or not, but really they're couched in terms of whether we can defend the idea of moral responsibility or not. Right, right. And it, they get a bit um, they get a bit confounded, in my view, because that's a that's a whole the question of moral responsibility and morals in general is a whole other area. Mm -hmm. it, it it depends a bit on free will, but it has its own sort of things going on. Um, and so what I try to do in the book is actually tease those apart, and just ask. Well, you know, rather than saying, can we have a type of free will that is sufficient to defend our systems of moral responsibility, let's just ask, what kind of will do we have and how free is it? And then go from there. Yeah, so I mean, obviously the, 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 the crux of, I think, the issue of what makes it important is this idea of responsibility, right? If you don't, yeah. if it's just strict determinism, many people will say, right, who gets the, the praise or the blame for things? Can you have... Mm -hmm. Where does responsibility lie if we're just, you know, uh, being being controlled by some kind of, uh, you know, puppeteer of sorts, whatever that may be, and mm -hmm. so it becomes really essential. So the 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 book is great because 
it gets very much in the fine details, which I was so happy about. I was happy that you went so so detailed. So we can go detailed as you want here as well. Right. I guess the first question I want to know is kind of like your main thesis here, which is in having agency and free will, why is, imp- why is it important to understand that uh, rooted within an evolutionary story and model and structure? So why, mm-hmm. why do we need to look at uh, various aspects of biology or genetics to understand this, this concept of free will? It's not that it's just for philosophers to deal with or sociologists to deal with. You're saying, no, we can understand this um, really at the neuronal level. We can understand mm-hmm. this. So you can explain that, but I guess kind of the meta question there is, why is that kind of uh, path very important to understanding free will? Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, that's a great question. And, and really, um, uh, p- part of the answer is just to, to think of free will. So it has this sort of um, almost mystical connotation. And part of the debates around free will is that when people hear it, they, it, it sounds like some magical capability that we would have, that our self or our soul or our spirit, something immaterial, would have that somehow can be a cause in the universe without being caused itself, right? An uncaused cause, it's a sort of a metaphysical challenge, right? And it's very abstract. And, um, and it's, it's a sort of a, yeah, a dualist notion. And it, it makes it seem like either we have a choice between hard sort of, you know, physics and, and determinism and just saying this is all mechanism at work and, and there's nothing for you to do. It's just the mechanisms doing whatever they're going to do. It, it seems like there's a choice between that or there's a ghost in the machine and the ghost is somehow in charge. And then you have the whole problem of, wait, what is that? How, yeah. how, how does that self or spirit emerge and how could it control things if it's an immaterial thing, right? So I want to recouch that whole framing and just say, look, let's just think of free will or agency as a biological capacity. And we don't have to use those loaded terms. Let's say the capacity to control behavior, right? Which all living organisms have to some degree, not just, not just humans. And if we want to understand any biological thing, then uh, an evolutionary approach is generally a good idea because life is an evolutionary process, right? It got that way. Things are the way they are because they got that way. And that's absolutely just the crux of, of life, really. And so taking an evolutionary approach seemed fairly natural to trying to understand um, agency as a biological capacity. So how, how is it that an organism as a whole being, as a whole thing, can do things in the world when things like rocks can't do anything, right? I mean, it's a, it sounds absurd to say it like that, but there's a very, very fundamental property of living things that we tend to overlook, right, which is agency. It's not there if you open a biology textbook and you look for the properties of life. It'll be, you know, replication and reproduction and metabolism and stuff like that. But it won't be agency, which I think is an oversight, because living things can do things and non-living things can. That's just a really fundamental separation um, that's interesting to investigate. Well, how is that? How is it that when you put matter together in a certain organization, the whole thing as a coherent entity can now act in the world, it, it can act in the first instance just to keep itself organized over time as a thing, but but it can also act as a cause on the world. And how can that um, how could that come to be? And so, my feeling was that if we wanted to understand free will in humans, so here I'm just using free will to mean the the sort of the most complex elaboration of this biological capacity that that we currently know of. Um, then if we want to understand anything complicated, we should start with the simplest sort of versions of it and and try to ground some basic concepts um, so that we can see, okay, how can I build up an understanding of of this capacity? And there's a natural route to doing that because nature in evolution built up that capacity. And so if we follow that trajectory, we can hope to get a better understanding of the phenomenon that we're interested in. Mm. There's a, there's a handful of uh, follow-ups there, but I, I, I think it will come out by some of the other things you mentioned here. So you, you talk about Penfield's experiments, knowing of how an animal is controlling their own thinking, and you also mm. look to physics to discuss hard determinism and soft determinism. Mm. 
So maybe kind of elaborate those differences, hard and soft determinism, and, sure. and how can we know as best we can, you know, how much an animal can control their own thinking or not? Yeah. Well, uh, let me back up a bit uh, because I think there's there's sort of three mm-hmm. routes that people use to challenge the idea that we could have free will or that indeed that any animal could be really an agent. Um, and so one of them we kind of mentioned already, which is I would call biological fatalism. Right? It's the idea that that we are right now at any moment are configured in a certain way that uh, brings with it motivations, mental states, memories, all our past experience, our genetics, the way our brain developed, the evolution of the human race, everything else, right? All that, all those past causes have configured us right at the moment, uh, the way we are right in the moment. And that configuration is going to determine the way that we behave in a given scenario. Now, that's one sort of worry. I'll, t- I'll say right now that the word determine there is just too strong. Right? Those things influence the way we behave. They don't determine it. Um, but that's, so that's one level where you can say, look, my mental states, my beliefs and desires and intentions and so on are entailed by the physical configuration of my brain right now. And I didn't choose what that configuration is and I can't do anything about it and it's just going to make my behavior play out in a certain way. So that's one level of concern. And then there's another level of concern, which com- really comes from neuroscience these days. And a, lo- a lot of neuroscientists are advancing this view that, you know, we can look in there. We can, we can poke around in the brain. We can see what parts are active when you're making these decisions, when you're having certain emotions, when you're, you know, you're thinking about a goal or you're making a decision. We can intervene in those processes in... Uh, you know, in humans to a certain degree, in animals to a huge degree with incredible precision these days where we can, you know, activate different neural circuits, different populations of neurons and make an animal go left, go right, sit up, roll over, go to sleep, attack, try to mate some, you know, all sorts of behaviors um, and even tweak the actual parameters of cognition themselves. So not just make the animal do something, but really make the animal think something. I mean, to the point of like implanting a false memory, for example. Mm -hmm. So the amazing degree of control that we seem to get by intervening in the neural mechanisms can make it seem like it's just mechanism, Mm -hmm. right? That that we have a full explanation of what's going on in uh, as an explanation of some behavior. It's because this neural circuit fired and then this one did and then that one did and then it went to the muscles and that's the whole electrical circuit. And what more do you want, right? There's no room for what those neural firings mean to, to really have any causal power in that system. You know, I've just given you a complete picture. That's the, the is what some people argue uh, of these neural circuits firing. That that's all the causation we need. So, um, so that's a concern. It's a sort of reduction, right? A reductionism to the level from a psychological level, where you're saying, look, your cognition is important in in um, in you determining your behavior to a neural level where you're saying, look, you are not determining your behavior at all. It's just parts of your brain are active Mm -hmm. and you're being pushed around by your own parts. Now, there's another level down, which is to say, look, if you're doing reductionism, why stop at the level of neurons? Keep going. Neurons are just physical things. Mm -hmm. They're full of molecules and atoms and particles and ultimately quantum fields. All those things have to obey the laws of physics. If the laws of physics are deterministic, that is, what's going to happen is definitely the, what's going to happen. There's just a certain configuration of physical stuff. There's a certain arrangement of forces impinging on that physical stuff. They'll play out in a certain way. All of that is predetermined from the dawn of time. Uh, then not only is it ridiculous to think that uh, you know an agent could have a choice, it's ridiculous to even think that alternate futures could exist, right? I mean, the ultimate sort of expression of determinism is to say there's only one future. And it it is what it always was going to be. And nothing we can do can change that. Um, it's just the playing out of these uh, deterministic physical rules. Um, and that, to me, well, that's what's known as hard determinism. It's what I call pre-de- physical predeterminism. Um, to try and distinguish it from another kind of a worry, which is simply that uh, 
okay, maybe it's not really 100% determined at that low level. Maybe there's some indeterminacy in, in the physics itself. But even if that's true and something's, you know, randomly swerve one way or another, when we get to the macroscopic level, all of the causation is coming from what happened at the low level. So it's still reductionist in terms of causality. It's just that, you know, the worry is, well, okay, you can admit that maybe there's some indeterminacy, but you're still not in charge, right? That's the concern. And um, what I want to do in the book is build up a picture of how, first of all, that physical predeterminism, even physics says that's not right. Uh, and secondly, how having some uh, indeterminacy uh, or, or indefiniteness under determination at those low levels gives some causal slack in the system. It means that the way the system is organized can constrain how things happen. Without violating laws of physics, it's just a higher order constraint on, on what happens in the system. And that ultimately that's what allows life to exist because life just is a whole bunch of constraints on stuff to keep it all organized in a certain way through time. So I guess here, is it the, is it the fact that there's different levels of how things are operating and at one level you could have this illusion of free will Mm -hmm. And there is an element, element of deterministic notion that this equals this or this plus this equals this. And this is a kind of pattern that goes on and on and on. Or are you saying all the way down across all levels that it's all has you know, agency. It all has potential to be uh, being able to make decisions. Whether you know it or not, you mm. consciously or whatever is another story. Mm. But at, at the innate capacity, if you will, of uh, you know, down to the nucleus of a cell, let's say, or or different neurons, like there is a chance it could be this way, this way, this way, this way. What I guess what's the what's the boundaries or contours of how much agency is at different levels here, and how much yeah. do we know about it or not, and is that important? It's super important and uh, in many ways. And so, first of all, let me say I don't, I don't like to draw sharp lines. So I don't think uh, even you know for things like agency or sentience or intelligence or even consciousness mm -hmm. that there are sharp lines in nature. I think there are both gradations and differences in kind. You know, I think the sentience of an octopus uh, or the agency of a fly may be different from the sentience or agency of a human being. Sure, um, sure. Not just less, but different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so actually, I think you can make an argument that even the simplest creatures that we know of, which are single-celled bacteria, basically, mm -hmm. um, the simplest free-living creatures, have agency and, um, and are not just either pushed around by things in the environment or pushed around by their own parts. So let me, uh, let me try and illustrate that. So if you think of a, a bacterium like an E. coli, right, these bacteria that live in our gut, um, they can do lots of things. They, they, they exhibit lots of behaviors that are ecologically adaptive, right? So for example, they will move towards a food source and they'll move away from threatening substances. And they'll, you know, they'll reconfigure their internal metabolism depending on what's out in the world, what sugars are available, how crowded the situation is, how many other bacteria are around, what threats there are, all this kind of stuff. So, so they're very reactive. Um, and I would say they're reactive in a very holistic sense. Um, and in an adaptive sense, which um, is doing th effectively is doing things for reasons, and the reasons, even though they don't, they're not thinking about them, they're not reasoning, but they have reasons in the sense that um, they're configured the way they are because that helps them to persist, right? So life is the, is a game of persisting. It's a uh, you can think of a living organism like a bacterium as a particular pattern of both stuff and processes. And really it's the processes, it's the dynamic metabolism and, and replication and reconfiguration of the thing that, that makes it a living organism through time. Now, that, that um, need to persist in order to be alive grounds some purpose 
and some meaning and some value. So purpose is a, is a word that's kind of slippery. Um, some people are kind of allergic to it. It sounds not very scientific, right? And what I mean is simply this. Um, it's, a, it's almost a circular tautological kind of phrasing here because simply put, things that are configured in a way that, that will make them tend to persist will persist. Mm -hmm. And things that aren't won't. And so the things that we see necessarily are configured in that way that makes them persist. And they have to do work, right? I mean, the, the second law of thermodynamics is saying this particular organization of matter and processes is really unlikely. And it takes energy to, to maintain it that way. So uh, it should just break down. And if left to its own devices, it will just break down and decompose and the bits will dissolve away, right? So living things have to do work to stay organized. And in doing that, one of the ways that they can um, help to do that is to be able to sense things in the environment and react to them in ways that will help them to stay organized. So moving towards a food source is a good strategy to configure into your biochemistry, in the case of a bacterium, um, as a what we can call a control policy. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not thinking about it. Uh, but it, it has a tendency to move towards food, which is a good thing to do. Now, when people look at that, um, you can work out the biochemistry. It's really nicely worked out. So you've got your little bacterium. Um, it, has, it has sensors on you know, proteins that sit in the membrane that detect things outside. And when they detect a sugar, for example, they give a little wiggle inside, mm -hmm. inside the membrane. And that sends a signal into the internal parts of the bacterium, which eventually impinges on this motor, which is called a flagellum. It's like a long filament. It works like an outboard motor mm -hmm. um, that determines which way the bacterium goes. So you can kind of isolate that system and say, oh, look, it's just a linear pathway that involves just these components within this big bacterium. And actually, the bacterium is being pushed around by these separate parts. You know, just this little bit of it is determining which way it goes. So the bacterium as a whole is not making a decision. It's just a biochemical reflex. And I think that's um, kind of an illusion. I think it's wrong. I think that's a wrong perspective. It's an illusion that we fall into partly because in the lab, we do these reductive controlled experiments, right? We're interested in one pathway at a time. We control everything else. We keep everything in the environment constant except the thing that we're interested in. We, we try to keep the context as, as consistent as possible. And then we isolate functionally this one pathway. And that makes it look like that's all that's happening. But of course, in nature, that's not all that's happening, right? Our bacteria is not just encountering one thing at a time and making binary choices. It's having to keep itself configured through time. It's having to make adaptive behavioral choices in a scenario that can involve loads of different signals. There can be loads of different sugars and chemicals that it doesn't like um, in the outside and has to integrate across those and decide where to go. It has to... Uh, take into account all kinds of context, like what's the temperature, what's the pH, what's the osmolarity, how many other cells are around, what's, my in, what's, what's the internal state in terms of nutrient status, and so on. Um, and then it also has to integrate over time. So this decision-making is not a, a, an instantaneous thing. It's a process that has some duration in time. Um, and in fact, the bacterium does that by integrating, uh, by, by basically comparing the level of, of the sugar at time T plus one to the level that it was at at time T. Right? So really, it's a big, great big integrative holistic uh, process that involves loads and loads of parts all working together in the service of the goal of the whole organism, not the goal of the parts. Right? So um, altogether, I think you can make a defense of the idea that even the simplest creatures that we know of have some degree of agency or proto-agency um, where they're doing things for reasons, even if they don't have a, it's not a very sophisticated control system, it's not a reflective control system, they're not thinking about anything, they're not internally representing sort of semantic states, it's just a lot of pragmatic con you know, configuration. But, um, but I still think it, it amounts to the start of agency and it allows us to, um, to ground these concepts of purpose and meaning and value 
that we see over and over again, they just get elaborated on through evolution. I guess the question I have here is, I mean, you, you detail that very nicely. I guess the question I have is, is if you don't know it as such, is it a choice, right? Like, yeah. E. coli doesn't have metacognition. Right. Uh, I mean, as far as we know, I mean, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. But it, it's no. one of those things where it's like, how how could you explain those things as as mm, the precursor or the the origins or the 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 basics of choosing or agency and not yeah. I mean I agree with everything you said but that sounds like uh, and then how do you explain it but that just sounds like reactions like it's it's, yes. it's not choosing when I think of choice I think I guess of uh, this is just how I think of it so I could be wrong but. You have at least more than one option, so mm -hmm. two or three or four or ten or twenty or whatever, and you have the ability to choose any of those, um, and you know it. Like there's a, there's yeah, a knowing yeah, yeah, yeah. there, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I guess I guess I guess maybe on one level it's like yes, there's a type of uh, agency or free will if you want if you know it and even if you don't know it it still could be but you just don't know it and my question would be so so what difference does it make i guess at that point yeah, but yeah, yeah how are these things not just reactions or yes. impulses or responses in this kind of true sure. behavior sense yeah and how do you make it no more it's a great confusing? it's a great question so um as i said in the bacteria what i would say is that they have a kind of a minimal proto agency right i'm not i'm not saying they're fully fledged um <laughs> yeah. Agents like we are, right? right, right, right. Um, so I, I think you can say, when we think about reflexes or just reactions, right, we're usually thinking of one thing at a time, yeah. right? So if you have a shine a light in your eye, your pupil dilates, whatever, you hit your knee, that your, 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 your leg goes out, okay? So when, when you move to a situation where the organism is not just reacting to one thing at a time where there's a, an obvious right thing to do every to every stimulus that it gets or a hardwired sort of thing to do. When you move from that to a situation where it's encountering multiple cues, lots of information about things in the world, and it has to, in a sense, integrate all that information and uh, and optimize over multiple possible behaviors, right? What's go towards this food, go towards that food, uh, stay with my, you know, other bacteria, move to this place. All these sort of options are, uh, at least in, uh, in the physical sense, open to the bacterium to do. Now, what you can, what you can say is that that organism is going to have some level of information about what's out in the world. It's going to have some of these pre-configured control policies about what it should do. Uh, but they are they're not linear right they're they're highly sort of interdependent and contextual and they're so contextual actually that uh, you can't decompose them in fact it's the relations between them that give the thing its holistic nature if you try to pull them apart in that reductive way you get this illusion of a reflex or a simple reaction when in fact you've decomposed the very system that you should be studying which is in those contextual relations between them mm. so what i want to say is that that ultimately it's the organism as a whole that settles the outcome of what's going to happen because it's got some information about what's out in the world it's it can be quite ambiguous information right it's limited it's got noisy components um it's got noisy components internally so so really it's doing its best to figure out what the best thing to do is and ensure that that's what happens that's what i would say and in fact i think there's a there's a there's a deeper point here which i which i can get to i want to see if what i said satisfies you at all uh, and then there's a deeper point that I want to get to, which is a ch flipping, a flipping the perspective from choice to control. Well, it sounds like I think you did a little bit there of this idea of parts of the whole. There's this idea that if you're seeing it in one, when you when you when you take one thing out, you're seeing it as just this reflexive reactionary thing. But there's something that's happening by looking at it that way. Of well, here's all the other things that happened in which there was having to be a choice. Is, is that right? Well, it's, it's the idea is that all the other things provide necessary context. And uh -huh. it's not that they give choice, it's that they give holism 
okay. to okay. the to the process. It's the gestalt it's the, of it. It's the agent doing it, right? It's it's sorry. Let me just say, if we don't want to presuppose agency, let's say it's the organism as a whole doing it. Uh -huh. It's not. It's not being pushed around by individual parts because actually all the parts are so contextually interwoven with each other mm -hmm. that it doesn't make sense to decompose those or you lose the important relations between them. That, that's the argument for sort of contextual integrative holism. Um, and also I would add to that that these organisms are not just sitting there passively waiting for a stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. They're not a passive stimulus mm -hmm. response mm -hmm. machine. They're endogenously active. Uh, as we are, as every organism is, right? They have to be active. That's what being alive means. So internally, they're incredibly active. And what they're doing is accommodating to incoming information to maybe reconfigure things in such a way that either their metabolism is slightly different or they will move in this direction or that direction and so on. So it's a more, uh, it's just a much more organismic way of looking at it and a much less mechanistic way of looking at it. It doesn't so, solve your choice. It doesn't solve your choice problem yet. <laughs> well, I guess the okay. So here's my question: Here is is you can do this at different levels, and we can get to I guess some of these levels. But at the cellular level, all the way down to mitochondria, all the way down to unicellular versus multicellular organisms, there are things that are seemingly mechanistic, right? Like when you think about sure. how let me just is this an example? I mean. I need a, a certain amount of – I always go to embryology for this stuff. You need a uh -huh. certain amount of things to go right, <laughs> and it happens over and 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 over for millions of years with all yep. organisms, all mammals at the very least in this example. Um, and there's a certain time of weeks and there's a certain you – know, and there's always a little bit of variance, but that, I don't think that changes the whole pattern, the whole mm -hmm. kind of way in which – because it – if there was too much free will, we, we wouldn't be able to, to to be an organism, right? We would be we would fall apart, right? We wouldn't be able to, exactly. to develop or create. So so I guess that there are things that are always I don't say always, but there's a there's a there's a a very similar pattern enough to say this is what it is to you know procreate or this is at yeah. this stage and this stage. So there's enough things. It's not all different it's not all these choices sure. so i guess how and what you're saying here how do it seems like a contradiction i have a feeling it's not but how mm -hmm. are those two things cohabitating yeah yeah so you put your figure on the problem of control right so typically in the mm, philosophical debates about free will um the debate starts with this position of determinism and everybody for some reason that i can't fathom accepts that physical determinism is true, and then they go on from there. And they typically either end up as compatibilists who will say, okay, look, you really didn't have any choice. You're really not actually in control of your actions, but it's very complicated what's happening inside you. And we can treat it as if you're the source of what happened and you did things for some reasons, even if you didn't have a choice, but they're, we'll say they're your reasons and we can assign moral responsibility and protect our, our, our view of that. Um, I find that just a weird position, frankly, and it's somewhat incoherent um, in that if there's physical predeterminism holds, there's no choosing, there's no mattering, uh, there, there's no causation actually in the world in a normal sense. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I don't think, never mind agents choosing, I don't think living things would ever have evolved in that kind of universe. Okay. The, the alternative point is you start with determinism, you accept what I just said in my critique of compatibilism, and you say, well, okay, free will must be an illusion. You can end up a free will skeptic where you say, really you're saying that uh, physics, that certain interpretations of physics have convinced you that the basic phenomenology of our existence is, is illusory. That in fact, despite appearances and, uh, and experience, we don't, in fact, make decisions. We're not in control of anything. Nobody else does anything, and no animals act, really act as causals in the world. Mm -hmm. So I would like to flip that and say, look, why are we accepting determinism as true? Indeterminism clearly seems to be uh, the case in physics, right, at the quantum levels and even at classical levels. The idea that classical physics is deterministic just rests on a bunch of assumptions and approximations and idealizations that don't 
really have a lot of support for them. So what you can say is, okay, well, now that changes the perspective. Now we have a different problem. Rather than saying, how could it be that an organism could have choice? Where does the freedom come from? We can say, well, wait a minute. How does an organism control all this stuff? If it's got noisy components that are jittering around, um, how does it exert control in order to make sure that what it wants to happen actually does happen? Right? So for it to be a cause, for it to exert will in, in the world, um, how does that happen? That's a different problem. And actually, your example of development is an interesting one because a developing organism has that problem. Right? It, 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 the goal there, and it's, it does this in a passive way, but the goal is that, that it produces a new, a new instance of a species, of an organism of certain species. Um, even with whatever variations there there are there, but it, it, the goal is to make a viable one, right, within the viable range. Right. Right. Um, and in order to do that, a lot of the processes of development are configured in such a way as to be incredibly robust to noise, right? They they, they actually can make a heart in the right place despite the fact that the proteins and genes and things that they use are really noisy and there's fluctuations in the number of molecules and the binding of proteins to each other and everything else. So it's a, it's a nice example, I think, of, um, of a living organism being configured in such a way as to bring something about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In this case, it brings about the formation of the, of, of the organism. But you can say the same sort of idea is at play when an E. coli is reconfiguring its internal metabolism so that it can digest lactose instead of glucose. Or, you know, when bacteria are going from anaerobic to aerobic respiration or whatever it is. Or when it's configuring itself in such a way as to move through the world towards a source of something like a sugar or a nutrient. Um, and it can sense that and it, and it can guide that control of its own configuration in response to information about the world, right? So now we've moved away from purely physical causation. So it's not the case that when a sugar binds to this receptor that, you know, it's not energy being pushed across. It's not material being pushed into the thing. It's just a change in config confirmation of a protein. It's just information. And so, um, you move from purely physical causation to informational causation, where that kind of system evolves to enable the organism to control itself and uh, to control its movements in the world for things that can move in such a way as to um, better adapt its, its conditions to be in better conditions to allow it to persist through time. And at some level... Um, th those things get so complicated that it really is not a predetermined outcome, right? It's, it's just not the case that if you rewound the clock and you put the organism into exactly the same physical circumstances, you would get exactly the same outcome because you have these noisy components. You wouldn't, you so, wouldn't get exactly the same outcome, but you would still, in this case, get a... Uh, a, 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 a successful fetus right a fetus that you know that comes that goes goes to full term and you know it's it's a child and etc yes if you were to put back all of those things in the same it would not be exactly the same i agree with you on that yeah. but you there's enough deterministic systems that you will get a child at the end of the day sure. right yeah How so can what i want to say is either? yeah i want to say regulatory systems instead of deterministic systems Right. Fair enough. So that, Fair enough. And, and I want to say, you know, I want to talk about influences instead of determinants. And I think that just changing that language okay. gets us away from a really, really deterministic view. Um, so, yeah, and in, in development, I mean, as, as you know, my last book was largely mm -hmm. about this, this variability of development as an interesting source of variance in all kinds of aspects of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so you can look at that in, in two ways. You can look at it and say, oh, look here's this indeterminacy that's that's driving the outcome somehow. Or you can say, look, despite this indeterminacy, the organism does a really good job of corralling all these elements and making a viable outcome within the range of things that it cares about, right? It's got some, some margin for error. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same is true in our decision-making. You know, a lot of the time, if we did that rewind the clock thing and ask, could you have done otherwise? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, maybe the answer is 
No, because you wouldn't want to do otherwise, right? You do what you wanted to do. That's what you should be impressed by, the fact that the organism was able to do what it wanted to do. Um, and the that, in a sense, is an exercise of doing things for reasons, which I think is one way of talking about choice and decision-making. You're doing things for your own reasons. And in the outside world, in some scenario, yeah, you objectively, you could go left or right. In For your own reasons, you might always want to go right because there's something that you like over there. Uh, and you doing that is, is an act of agency. Right? That's you controlling what happens for your own reasons. Now, in some scenarios, there may not be much of a difference between left and right. So there may be some randomness in, in which way that goes. But in other scenarios, it's you controlling it um, despite all that randomness. <laughs> but I guess the, the, the question that I, I keep coming back to is, so if, if, if we're scaling up, I guess, in terms of human yeah. decision-making here, but I guess the question for in that scenario is, I don't know why I want to go left or right. I have no. It came into my head. I have no reason why. I choose right every time, and that's the time I go left. I have. I don't know where that motivation or that 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 uh, incentive came from. I just yeah. chose to go left this time. Sure. And it and it comes from somewhere, but I don't yeah. know where it comes. Just like you know, I'm sure you've heard this before. You know, I don't know. I have plans of what I'm going to do this afternoon, but I don't know what I'm going to do this afternoon. I don't know the next sentence I'm going to say. I'm going sure. to say it, but I'm not choosing. I'm not getting into my head and saying, okay, you have 10 sentences to choose. Pick this one. And I pull the lever on mm -hmm. that one. I'm not choosing. I'm I'm responding. Now, maybe there's a there is a there is some part of our, if you will, consciousness or unconscious that's doing all that, and I'm not aware of it. But mm -hmm. in terms of my awareness, I'm not making a choice. I, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not so, ever doing that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I see, what you're, I see what you're saying. And I think there are many scenarios that are like that. And I think there are lots of scenarios that are not. And, and I think to mm -hmm. extrapolate from the scenarios that are like that to say, look, here's a scenario. I don't, I don't know why I did this. It was arbitrary. You know, I chose coffee or tea, whatever, to use an example from, from Sam Harris. And he would say, well, why did I do that? I have no idea why I decided to do that. It just happened that it, it felt like to me like I wanted tea more than coffee or whatever. Mm -hmm. Fine. I'm perfectly happy to say that that kind of a scenario does not involve deliberative choice. That doesn't mean none of our decisions involve deliberative choice. So many of our decisions are habitual, right? We're not thinking about them in the moment because we thought about them before loads of times and it always worked out that we did such and such. And, you know, turns out we like coffee. So we're choosing coffee, right? Um, and that's not a problem, right? The fact that many of our behaviors are habitual does not mean we don't have free will or can't exercise agency. It's just that's a means of exercising behavioral control that is offloaded onto automatic processes, a lot of the learning that we've done before, and that so we don't have to make decisions in the moment about every little thing, right? We already know yeah. how things should go. Mm -hmm. So habitual stuff I don't think is a, is a challenge to our ideas of free will. I think it's a mechanism by which we exercise our own agency. And then you can have these scenarios where, okay, it's not a habitual thing, it's some novel choice, some choice that you really don't care about. Um, uh, but what you do care about is doing something, right? It's important to do something, to not just dither forever and vacillate with this, yes. Yes. Me with yes. this meaningless choice yes. that either you don't have the information to tell what's a good, what's a good option, a uh, better option, or you don't have a reason to care, I, whatever. Right? For example, so, if, if, if I go to the restaurant, I was at a restaurant last night, and mm -hmm. I get a menu, literally a menu of options, right? And yep. I don't know. I literally am blank. I have no idea. I have never been to this place. I have no idea what I want. I'm not in, really in the mood for anything in particular. I'm just, I'm hungry. But yep. so my my <laughs> my stomach is telling me to make make a choice. You, right. you, should, you should make a fucking choice. So we're going to, exactly. we're going to just choose anything. Right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there. And there's, I don't know, 20 options, right? There's too many options, to be honest. And I'm like, I, I narrow it down for whatever reason to mm -hmm. two. I, like, I could have this or I could have this. And I go back and forth and I think through all these things. I say, well, I could do this or this or this or this. 
and I really can't make a decision. So I just say, fuck it. We're going to do this one. And that right. was a choice that I made. You're yeah. saying in that scenario, I'm making an active choice, but I, I don't, I don't well, know I, how what I I'm saying is, yeah, yeah. I mean, what I'm saying is that sometimes uh, there are scenarios where we just say, fuck it and uh, mm -hmm. let our brain in a sense make yeah. a choice and we don't right. care. Right. And that's a, and that's a good thing to do. That's an adaptive, <laughs> uh, valuable thing to do because otherwise we would spend forever trying to figure out yeah. when in fact it's impossible to figure out what's right. the better option, right? You just right. don't have the information or you don't have the motivation to care about the options, right? So again, what I would say is the existence of those kinds of scenarios doesn't mean that we never make more deliberative choices for reasons. Okay. So, so what's lots the, of things that you, well, right. lots of things that you do, lots of behavior that you do is guided by reasons, and it's guided by reasons that you can think about. So this idea that our own reasons are completely opaque to us just doesn't seem to jibe with okay. normal experience, right? <laughs> so, so can you give me, a, what's, give me an example of these two differences, where okay, one where well, we are making you, one and one where we're not? Okay, so you invited me to come on this podcast, Correct. and I had some reasons to do that because I like talking to you, and I think we're going to have an interesting conversation. <laughs> and uh, I've written this book, and I'd like people to hear about it and think about these ideas. Okay, mm -hmm. those were my reasons. I deliberated, not for very long, uh, and I said, yeah, that sounds great, right? <laughs> um, I mean, there were some counter things, which are like not whether I would come on or not, but when, like because I'm, mm -hmm. you know. I've got other things happening and this schedule and blah, blah, blah. So I've got some options. Uh, some I have some goals uh, that are conflicting with each other. I have to deliberate and adjudicate between them um, and then make a, what I think to, what I take to be an optimal uh, global decision right? yeah, across yeah. that whole, that whole landscape of, of goals that's happening all the time. Right. So I think most of our behavior actually, well, a lot of our behavior is like that. As I said, some of it's some of it's habitual. Uh, some so let's say okay, let's let's back up. Some of it's really really deliberative. Mm -hmm. Some things we deliberate over like a long time, like whether to accept a job offer or right. a marriage proposal or something right. like that. Those are yeah. big decisions. Yeah, big we're going to spend decisions. some spend some time thinking about those. We're way up the pro, pros and cons. We say, look, we envision a future when we do accept a job or don't, and and mm -hmm. think about that. Right. So right, right. all of that is really doing things for reasons. Mm -hmm. And then there's, uh, you know, ones like I talked about coming on here where, okay, yeah, I have my reasons. It didn't take long. Uh, there were good reasons to do it, and I did it. Um, and then there's a bunch of habitual stuff where we have good reasons to do it, and we're just going to do it. We don't need to think about it. And if you want to think about uh, actually what the bacteria do, it's sort of like that, right? It's habitual. It's sort of wired in there. Mm -hmm. They don't want to think about it. Evolution has wired it in. It's not their individual choice or individual learning. They, have, they don't learn from experience very much. Um, so they're kind of habitually driven, but they're still doing things for reasons. And then you get to these scenarios where we don't give a shit, right? Mm -hmm. What happened? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and then we have to just flip a coin, as it were. Mm -hmm. So... So it's I think like all how, of those it's things. Like this is how people voted in the last election. They just <laughs> 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 they flip the coin. It, it doesn't be. matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you throw the darts at the dartboard, or, or you just leave, whatever, or right. you just stare. You just stare at the menu for long enough until you're <laughs> something happens. You know, something says, "Yeah, goat's cheese." Sure, that sounds good. Why not? <laughs> um, but let me say something else. So, so I think a lot of the debate um, again around decision making, and this is true for philosophical debates, philosophical thought experiments. And it's true for the real experiments that people do in neuroscience. They're really focused on these binary, instantaneous decision points mm -hmm. where you say, okay, the rat can go left or right. The person can choose X or Y. Um, you know, it's all set up, framed in that kind of a way. It's like, right now, what are you going to do? And to me, that gives a kind of a false view of how we control our behavior. Because actually, most of our behavior is sustained through time. And it's not just a binary decisions about isolated A sure. and B, and then next point C or D, and the next point E or F. It's just not like that, right? We're making decisions that guide our behavior and manage our behavior through time in order to pursue an agenda multiple agendas, sometimes conflicting with each other, nested over different time frames. We've got long-term goals. We've got short-term goals. Um, you know, somebody decides to go to college, that's going to direct and constrain their behavior through time because they know that in order to get 
uh, their degree, they have to go to class, they have to do their study, do their exams, and so on. We don't, we don't, um, we don't focus on those kinds of that kind of behavioral management mm -hmm. and, and uh, mm -hmm. agenda setting and and pursuit of agendas through time in, in as much uh, um, with as much emphasis as we should, because I think that's what's sort of really impressive about living organisms and especially impressive about humans is that we can set those agendas over decades, right? I mean, we have a time horizon, cognitive time horizon, mm -hmm. that's just, it could be infinite, right, in a sense, right? I mean, it's just vastly more than most other organisms that live really in the here and now. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I like to, you know, move a little bit away from this binary decision-making where there's A or B and just one is better than the other and it's sort of obvious what to do and, and we have to make the decision in an instant mm -hmm. to viewing this, this decision guidance of behavior as a, as a process through time mm -hmm. that organisms manage. And really, that reflects the idea that being an organism involves managing yourself to stay yourself through time, right? It's that duration through time, extension through time that is what I think we should be most impressed by when it comes to living organisms. Yeah, I certainly agree. So you and I have the same, I think, I think I remember, being, we'll, we'll probably come to sort of the same opinion on the self through time. I, I think you and mm. I, I think you and I have the same uh, uh, opinions there. So I'll be, I'll be, because I've had disagreements with people about this. So I'm, I'm just a, yeah. I'm just a bag of contradiction. So, <laughs> um, so I want to go. I want to go back to a kind of a, the cellular level because I, I was I yeah. was curious about some of these things. So I remember learning in 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 high school biology and even in my physio classes and things like that in, in grad school about ion channels. Uh huh. And I always had this question. So it was a really interesting reading about it in the book. Of well, yes, ion channels. You know, sodium and potassium. They open, they close, or whatever. And we learn about an action potential. Blah blah blah. And I always wonder, well, how do they know to close and open? How, do, how mm. does that, how do you, how do, how do, and, and you, you mentioned this in the book, and this will kind of maybe dovetail into this idea about vision and, and, and uh, you know, rods and cones and things like that. But how do, how do we know at that level, and you can maybe just set it up for listeners, or, you know, ion channels and how they work sure. on themselves, yeah. but you, you're, you're making the claim, and the reason I'm going back to this is because it seems like there's an element of it at this point of our, you know, cellular understanding, which you can then, in some ways, extract all the way up to bigger organisms. But this idea of sensing the environment, right? You were talking a little yeah. bit about it with E. coli, but but even yeah. at the cellular level, how did the there's this sensing of the environment of ion channels kind of knowing or choosing to open or close for how yeah. things need to be? Just chat about that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. If we think about um, you know neurons and the way that neurons work there's um there's often a sense that if you think of say reflex circuits from your knee you know i mentioned mm -hmm. earlier if you hit mm -hmm. your knee there's a sensory neuron will discharge will send an electrical as uh, you know little signal it'll go into your spinal cord it'll hit some other neurons it'll go back to your motor neurons which go and make your muscle contract Right, so from that from that view of that reflex arc, we get this idea of, of that ner that nervous systems work by driving force. Right, mm -hmm. it's an electrical force mm -hmm. in the same way that if you jab an electrode in there, and in fact Michael Faraday in experiments on frogs uh, with electricity actually did these kind of experiments. You can jab an electrode in a frog muscle, mm -hmm. right, and zap it, and it'll contract. It gives us this view of the nervous systems work by um, yeah, electrical activity, like it's a, it's a force, it's a driving force, right? Mm. Now, another way to think about it flips that on its head. And rather than saying that here's neuron A, and when it fires, it's going gonna, it's gonna to connect to neuron B, and it's going to make neuron B fire, right? Mm. So you get the drive is going like this mm. from A to B. Instead of that, you can think, well, wait a minute now. B is a cell, right? Uh, all of these cells in, in us are you know, in a sense, like single-celled organisms, right? They have a whole internal world. They're insulated from the rest of the universe by their cell membrane. And they have a way of figuring out what's going on in the world and then thinking, well, what should I do about it? So you can flip the script and say, actually, what's happening is neuron B is basically monitoring its inputs, 
It wants to know what's out in the world, just like an E. coli wants to know what's out in the world. In this case, in the nervous system, it, it wants to know that because it's functionally configured in a way to act as itself a signal uh, when some state of affairs is present and another state of affairs is not. Mm. Okay, that might be when neuron A is firing. It might be when neuron A and B are firing. Mm. It might be when neuron A fires five times a second or 10 times a second, right? There's all kinds of configurations that this neuron B can be sensitive to. So um, the, the way in which that's uh, controlled, that sensitivity is set, is by these the the synapses right the connections from one neuron to another how strong they are how many different neurons it's connected to what's the architecture of that and then this level of the ion channels that you were talking about mm. so the ion channels are proteins they sit in the membrane of a cell and they can open and close and like the name suggests they can when they open they form a channel through which electrically charged ions can pass mm. so ions are just atoms that have lost an electron or proton or something like that, right? Mm. So they're electrically charged. They can be positively charged like sodium or potassium. They can be negatively charged like chloride. Mm. So um, the way that neurons fire electrical signals is by conducting these electrically charged ions, right? They don't conduct electrons. They conduct charged ions. So the way that that conduction is, happens is by actually letting ions in and out of the cell at different points. Uh, along the, the the wire of the cell. So those um, ion channels, the first kind, are basically sensitive to neurotransmitter. So when neuron A fires, it's not injecting electricity into neuron B. It's releasing a neurotransmitter that is a piece of information, right, that these receptors on the surface of neuron B detect. Very similar to the way the receptors on the surface of a bacterium detect sugar, right? That's information for neuron B as to what's out in the world. Now, neuron B may be configured in such a way that if neuron A fires, like I said, 10 times a second, that's sufficient to drive enough ions to go into neuron B for it to, for it to be activated itself. It then sends a signal. That signal has a meaning. Mm -hmm. The meaning is neuron A fired 10 times a second. Mm -hmm. The, de the details don't matter that much, right? It could be 10 really fast or five, five fast and a break and five fast. It, it's, a, it's an overall rate through some duration of time. Now, maybe neuron B is configured in a different way. Maybe it's configured such that only if neuron A fires and neuron C fires, will that give it enough oomph to send its own signal. Mm -hmm. then, then the firing of neuron B means something else. Again, it's informational. Now the firing of B means A and C were both active. And whatever A and C mean in the world, if it's something outside or whatever, that must be the case. And then the organism has information that it can act on. So, um, so down at that molecular level, these, these ion channels are basically the mechanisms by which neurons uh, kind of compute their, their inputs or some integrate their inputs, basically, mm -hmm. in a way that, such that their configuration is, uh, enables them to report on the information that they're getting. The important thing in the nervous system that, that I think undercuts this idea of driving electrical activity and, and moves to a more informational view of what's going on is that a neuron not firing is just as informative and just as causally effective as a neuron firing. Right? If neuron A fires and neuron C doesn't fire, then neuron B not firing has information about A and C. Mm. Right? That's useful. So, um, so it moves from this mechanistic kind of view to a much more informational view. And so what, what um, organisms, you know, multicellular organisms, we, we've, we've skipped way forward in evolution yeah, here, right? We, so we, we were talking about bacteria, we, now we're we talking about multicellular <laughs> organisms <laughs> that... that that evolve nervous systems that basically are, are also control systems, mm -hmm. right? The, the point of a nervous system is not thinking, it's controlling the body yeah. in response to, and, 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 and to better control the body and keep the body alive, it should do that in an adaptive way depending on what's out in the world, mm -hmm. right? So all these systems arose and evolved to enable organisms to see, to sense what's out in the world, uh, to take sensory data, to infer what the causes of it are, um, and to inform um, adaptive action. Mm 
So, and, and there were a lot of systems uh, that evolved to choose, literally uh, choose between competing actions, whatever they might be, and however sophisticated the organism is. So that, that's, that, that system just isn't mechanistic. It has a, it has a, a physical instantiation, but the logic of how it works is informational, right? It's based on the meaning of these signals. That's what's important to the organism, not just this driving electrical activity. That all makes a lot of sense. And so I guess the question here is, not to be uh, uh, obstinate, but is there, in at this level, is there enough, I forget how you reframed it, but is there enough of this is how neurons work, this is how ion channels work. There's variability for yeah. maybe we do want to open or we do want to close or it takes this amount or does. The, the, the structure is still in theory going to happen, but there's enough yeah. choice. I'm using that loosely here. There's enough variance. There's enough things where it could be you know, this amount or this amount, you know, big or small right. or whatever. Yeah. Is yeah, that yeah. what you mean where there's, as it's interacting and receiving information in the environment, in the membrane, in other interactions with cells, that there's this idea of, well, we're going to choose now to go or now to close mm -hmm. or now, mm -hmm. or, you know, and that's going to yeah. be different every time. So what I will say is that there's, there's indeterminacy in the system because all these physical components are really noisy, right? Yeah. So these, pro these, for example, the level, the number of ion channels in this in the membrane of a cell is, is variable. It's variable from cell to cell. It's variable through time. That's just because the processes of making proteins and getting them to the right places, all of those just have some randomness to them, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, there's there's thermal fluctuations. There's whether you know proteins will bind to each other or not. That's just a kind of a prob probabilistic um, sort of thing. So, so neurons are made of noisy bits, right? Noisy components. And actually, it's interesting, John, John von Neumann, who was the, the originator of the you know, von Neumann computer architecture, has this great book called The Computer and the Brain, where he's asking this question, how can it be that, we, that brains can work when they're made of these really crappy components from, you know, electronics engineers would, would despair at thinking you could build something out of all these wet, jiggly components, right? <laughs> so, so what I want to say is that um, the system is configured in such a way uh, that these low-level little details don't matter so much. Right? So it's not that the noise drives what happens. It's precisely that the noise doesn't drive what happens, mm -hmm. which means that it's actually the higher order pattern that's important. So I referred to that a minute ago when I said neuron B is responsive to the rate of firing of neuron A. Right? Not to the precise pattern. So there may be 10 spikes in a second mm -hmm. from neuron A, but they could be ba 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 and, no, and nothing, or it could be but, 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 neuron B doesn't care, doesn't know, right? It's not set up to know, it can't know the difference between those things. It cares about the macroscopic pattern, mm. right? So little fluctuations will happen, and neuron B is insensitive to those, mm. right? It, it, it's configured in such a way as to be insensitive to those. Um, now, sometimes those little fluctuations will mean that only A only fired nine times, not 10 times. Right, and then B might not fire. Okay, so sometimes you'll get some noise that can percolate to a level that the system cares about, but mostly the noise is a problem for the system that it's configured in a way not to care about, but that also allows the macroscopic patterns to be the thing that determines what happens. Right, that it's not this momentary, every physical event of neuron A firing doesn't have causal power in the system. It's that pattern over time. And that is what I mean when I talk about some causal slack at the low levels, allowing the organization of the system to do some functional work. Mm. Right? And in living things, that organization, especially in nervous systems, that organization carries some meaning. And that means that the organism is, can, can do things at the overall level, right? Not just neuron A to B, but the whole level of the whole organism can do things based on it's information about what's out in the world. It's information about its internal states, what it believes to be the case, uh, what goals it currently has. You know, is it hungry? Is it thirsty? Is it horny? Whatever, mm -hmm. uh, all of those things. And then it, uh, what its uh, what its option possibilities are, what the affordances in the environment are. 
um, and it's projected utility uh, you know, predictions for what the outcomes of various actions would be. And then it makes it a, a choice. All that ambiguous information, some enough indeterminacy in the system that you can say it's not just a physical outcome that's predetermined. It's just the whole organism deciding things for reasons that matter at the level of the organism. So it's basically saying it, it gets away from that neural reductionism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Say it's not just a neural machine. It's not just an electrical machine. It's a machine that's doing cognition. It's using the neurons to do that, but cognition is a real thing. Beliefs and desires and cognitive states are real and they have causal power in the system. When I hear this, I hear, you're not saying this, so maybe I'm wrong and in, in I'm interpreting this, but it sounds like you're saying there's different dimensions of free will. Is, mm -hmm. is that free will at this level, where there is a little bit of slack, is necessary or, or helpful or you know, it has some utilitarian aspects to it, for then potentially creating a space when you scale it all the way up to the entire organism, let's say a human in this regard, to have choice uh, between certain things or many things continuously going forward with you know certain behaviors. Is there like a kind of uh, dimensional kind of quality here of like what types of different free will there are or, or is that wrong? Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely right. Again, I don't want to sharp, draw a sharp line. I mean, I think the term, the term free will, I, I usually sort of reserve for humans, but that's mainly just for historical convention more than anything else. And because it's such a loaded term, I mean, if you start, there's enough people who think humans don't have free will. If you start talking about animals having free will, they're really going to get up in arms, right? So a agency, I think, is a less loaded term. Um, but yes, I think there are gradations. I think... Um, I think you can see that across species. And one way to make that less vague, you know, we can say it seems like humans have more agency than insects or uh, frogs, uh, but dogs have more than frogs. Or, you know, what are, what, what are we talking about, right? What are the parameters that we're yeah. looking at that give us those intuitions? Um, well, one thing would be how many... Um, how many levels of processing do you have? How many things can you think about at once? How many, how many things can you sense? What's your sensorium, right? I mean, a bacterium sensorium is limited to the chemicals that its, to, its receptors can detect. Our sensorium, because we have vision, is you know, much less limited because all kinds of things are, light is bouncing off all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. in the environment, but it's still limited in the sense that we don't see in the ultraviolet and the infrared range. There's loads of information that we're insensitive to. So how much things are you responsive to? How many objects can you think about at once? How many goals can you balance at once? And especially, I think, how, um, how long into the future can you plan and sustain a behavior towards a goal? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really key point. Mm -hmm. And my feeling would be that it's a reasonable parameter to take as a measure of agency is that cognitive time horizon and the behavioral control horizon over which you can sustain behavior towards a goal. I think that's reasonable. Um, and, I, you know, I think... The, the comparison across species is one way to do that, but you can also compare within individuals, either through time. For example, babies don't have very good long-term planning, right? They're not thinking about things 10 years in advance. They're thinking about right now, is my belly full or not? Have I got a stomach ache or not? Uh, but over time, they come to be able to think about things further into the future, and they come to be able to control mm -hmm. their impulses, right? This is what happens as children mature, they can control their immediate impulses towards a further goal, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so they're becoming more sophisticated agents. And I think that's a reasonable uh, framing. I, you know, I think that you could defend that in any sort of quantitative, formalized sort of way, right? Um, you can see it when people take drugs or alcohol, mm -hmm. right? That changes their degree of agency, how impulsive they are, uh, you know, how, how they can control their behavior, basically, right? Um, you can see it in dementia or schizophrenia or depression or, or any number of um, conditions, or head injuries to various parts of the brain that impair decision-making and behavioral control. You know, all of which to me just emphasizes the fact that we're not talking about some mystical 
um, you know, uh, faculty bestowed on us by a deity in the Garden of Eden, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about free will, we're talking about a suite of evolved biological functions. And we can understand what those are. And we can see, in fact, the, the evidence that they differ between people is evidence that there's a real thing there that we can, that we can look at, right? Um, so, so in a way, I think we can demystify the notion of, of free will and just say, just naturalize it and say, look, we're talking about this suite of capacities of, for cognitive control. Some of it's very rational, deliberative control. Some of it's habitual action, selection, and so on. Uh, but all of that is that picture of how living organisms, including us, uh, act as causal agents in the world and manage to do things. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up about uh, uh, vision. I want to ask you about vision. You were talking about different organisms. <clears throat> I had um, uh, Lars Chitka, who knows every single thing about bees. The man is mm -hmm. brilliant. Uh, he wrote a great book, yeah. The Mind of a Bee. And it's... I mean, I remember reading the book. I remember having the conversation and listening back to it. It's, you know, I, I talked to him maybe a year, year and a half ago now. It's astounding to me how much intelligence and how much cognitive ability and how much, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it, you, you can't fathom how such a small insect has the ability and it really, you know, if future planning, some element of choosing, some element mm -hmm. of, and really, it's the the density of how everything's compacted into their brain, and it, it just it just it continues to blow my mind when I think yeah. about it. Or, and so it's interesting how humans have other things, but there's other things like you know we can't see the same way they can. In some ways, I mean, it's sure. it's at least different. I think in some ways it might be better, some ways it might be worse for for them and for us. So you know, it's just it's just fascinating how there is a lot of variability here for 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 humans. I mean, I find vision interesting because mm -hmm. I think vision is always a, for in humans. It, vision's interesting in general, but it's in, interesting in humans because it is. I always find it as an argument of why there isn't an intelligent designer because <laughs> the human <laughs> eye is not really great. There's a lot of almost yeah. everyone has to wear glasses at some point. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, there's other species that probably have better eyes and vision than we do. And mm. there's just all these flaws with it. I mean, it's, it's yeah. fantastic. The, the, ret the retina is the wrong way around. It's the right? wrong I mean, way the around. Nerves, the, the, the exit nerves are on the, it's on on the, the outside. On the, they yeah. have to, right. they make a blind spot, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it, there's so many problems with it. It's like, well, if you're an intelligent sure. creator and a designer, well, why the fuck would you make it with so many problems, right? That doesn't make any sense. Like whatever it's. It's the most unintelligent thing in some ways. So that is high. Like how – I mean there's a whole other conversation to say here about like, you know, mm -hmm. the world we're seeing is not the world that actually as it is, right? We're seeing yeah. a version of it, which mm -hmm. it bothers people, right? It's just like you tell people like you're not really seeing the color red or green. You're seeing elements of that, but it's because of how light works, things like that. But explain that process from the RGC to the thalamus to the occipital sure. lobe, that whole process with the, the cortical yeah. columns within the brain in how we're, we're seeing these things and how there's this choosing. I think it's really key because it couches um, perception as a, an act of sense-making, an act of interpretation of what's out in the world yeah. that is exactly what the organism needs to do. Okay, to, in order to survive. So it's a very goal-oriented, uh, objectively driven kind of a thing. So uh, let, let's, let's think, I mean, there's an important difference between the senses of uh, like smell, uh, which is basically just detecting some, some chemical, like E. coli basically are smelling those sugars and so on, right? They have a receptor, it binds to the thing directly, right? So when that receptor is bound, the sugar is directly outside the organism right there, mm -hmm. right now. And mechanosensation is the same thing. So a lot of uh, organisms, single-cell organisms, and all of our cells have little channels that when you, when you touch them, it sends a signal inside the cell. So they know they're being mechanically touched by something. So for example, um, nematodes, little nematode worm, worms, C. elegans, um, they have chemoreceptors, so they can smell things and they can touch things. But they have no vision and they don't have much in the way of hearing, really. Vision and hearing are not like that, right? They're not detecting 
directly, they're not directly binding the things of interest to the organism. What happens is they're detecting disturbances in the medium around the organism. So in the electromagnetic spectrum of light that's bouncing around or the vibrations of air or water or whatever the organism happens to be in for hearing, right? So if we just consider, I mean, vision, but it's the same idea for hearing, what the organism then has to do is say, look, I'm, we got some way to detect photons hitting your retina, but you're not interested in photons hitting your retina. You're interested in what they're bouncing off, right? Why is there a certain pattern of photons hitting my retina. So again, this is another example where the drive is, the causal um, efficacy here is not from photons, you know, giving some electrical energy and making your neurons zap in a certain way. It's the pattern of, of uh, photoreceptors that are being activated and, not, and the ones that are not active have just as much information as the ones that are active. And then there's a bunch of other cells that have to compare. Right? What they want to know is you've got two photoreceptors. One may have been hit by a photon, the other one wasn't. Well, that's interesting because maybe that reflects something out in the visual world, the edge of something. Mm. Right? So say if you've got a bunch of photons that are in a row and they're all active, but there's a bunch of neighboring ones that are not, maybe that's the edge of an object. Mm. Now that's something the organism cares about. Mm. So what you have in the retina is already in the retina, you've got you know four or five layers of, of three or four layers at least of cells that are doing this kind of comparison between photoreceptors, uh, either just for contrast or for the wavelength of light that's hitting them, which is basically how our color contrast is constructed. And you were right to say, there's no color out in the world. We're, we're literally just color coding our perception, mm -hmm. right? It's like we have a crayon set and we're just crayoning the world in our perceptual space, right? And why are we doing that? Because it's super adaptive. It's a great way to help separate objects. If we just relied on black and white contrast and luminance, we would miss out on a lot of stuff. So color vision evolved, um, so you know, for example. Discrimination, right? So we're discriminating yeah, exactly. between different stimuli. Yeah. Exactly. So what we see, so what we get is a bunch of, of, of photoreceptors hitting our, sorry, photons hitting our photoreceptors. And then we have all these layers of processing that are extracting what that means, right? They're inferring what could it be out in the world that's generating that pattern. Mm -hmm. That's a super hard problem. Right, because there could be many things that would generate the same pattern, and so what you need to do sometimes is actively explore. So an organism, because we're not just sitting static, right? We're moving our eyes, we're moving around, uh, we're learning from experience, we're using depth uh, differences between our two eyes to get depth perception, um, all of which allows us to better distinguish the objects in the environment from the from the surround, from the ground, um, and to figure out what we need to know, which is what's out in the world. And what should I do about it? Mm -hmm. right? And the what should I do about it then? Um, well, let me, let me just go. W once you get from you know, the retina into the thalamus and the cerebral cortex, you get all these levels. And they're all doing basically the same thing. They're, they're abstracting higher and higher order information about what's out in the world. So not just edges, but objects, and then types of objects, and then performing you know, categorizations. Like, that's a face. Uh, at, oh, that's, that's Xavier's face, right? And even when you turn your head to the left or the right, I still know it's your face, mm -hmm. right? So you did this feature invariant um, sort of uh, conceptual representation. And then, then we can link to memory, right? So now we've got organisms, of course, the great thing about nervous systems is they're not just perceiving things. They let organisms learn from experience. And so they accumulate knowledge about things. So when I see your face, I think of your voice and I think of the conversations that we've had and I think of other things that I know about you and I have a kind of a schema of you. I have a, an, an abstract kind of concept of you. It's linked to lots of memories um, and that then informs uh, you know, the way that I uh, will interact with you because I know we're having a talk about science and, and so on, right? So we do that all the time, and that's how um, nervous systems help individual organisms to set their own agenda through their own lifetimes, mm -hmm. right? It's not just like a bacterium which is carrying out natural selection's agenda, evolution's agenda that prefigured it a certain way. We carry out our own agendas through our own lifetimes. So we learn from experience, and we adapt, uh, and then we devise a you know, what will be appropriate behaviors in, in, under various circumstances. So, um, yeah, so I think the, the visual system is a great 
example of how behavior, again, is, is driven by the meaning of, of things, not by the really, really low-level details mm. of them, right? So uh, my behavior is being guided by the fact that I see your face here, not that it's your face in this particular orientation or that one or, or whatever, right? It's high-level abstract semantic uh, meaning that is contextualized by my prior knowledge of the world. Is it, this might be a terrible analogy, but it's like um, if I see brake pads and I see an engine and a transmission, I can say, oh, you know, I don't know how all those things really work completely. I know there is a way in which they work and they all work together. Them working by themselves don't really work. But the idea is together I have a car. And with a car, mm -hmm. I can choose to do things and go here or there or anywhere else. But if I just look at the one isolated point, you know, the timing belt or, you know, yeah. whatever, that in and of itself doesn't really tell me anything. I mean, it's not the best analogy, but I mean, the well, idea. Well, no, I mean, I think you can, you can run with it in the sense that you know uh, a car is good for driving around, right? And when you go get a rental car somewhere and they give you the keys and you go to the lot and you realize it's a blue car or a gray car or a red car, it doesn't matter, right? There's just a bunch of details that are incidental and arbitrary. And I mean, maybe you would have preferred a red car, who knows, right? But, um, but it's still gonna get you where you wanna go. That's what you care about, right? So right. all of those cars afford you the opportunity of transport. Mm -hmm. That's what an organism cares about. What, what is this thing and what can I do about it? Those two things are completely bundled up together, mm -hmm. right? They're not, they're not in a sense separated. You bring this knowledge of what you can do about it to the act of perception itself, right? You yeah, recognizing these, something these as a car that we have. is based on your prior experience with cars yeah. and knowing what cars are good for and what you think about the car is informed by all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's very much this you know, perceptual thing. Again, it's not this passive sort of just processing of data, it's you bringing your knowledge, and any organism does this, prior knowledge um, that, that's, that's stored in the configuration of the nervous system to the problem to interpret it, right? It's an act of interpretation. And it has to be because like I said, things in the world are first of all too ambiguous. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, um, you only care about what you can do about things, mm -hmm. right? Or what they can do to you. Mm -hmm. That's adaptive information, that's what drives organisms. Uh, that's what they need to know, right? It's on a need to know basis. So let's, I guess, move more into the brain in terms of, I guess, bigger components here. So in terms of decision making, so this is uh -huh. more, uh, I guess, becoming more proximate to the idea of choosing things like that. At a, at a, neuroanatomical level and then obviously still at a, uh, you know this is going through cortical and subcortical levels here so you know obviously you know we you know i mean there's things that i've learned i mean obviously you learn and teach this as well is that there are some things that are more uh declarative some things are more procedural right we have all these ideas in terms of memory but in terms of the costs and benefits of decision making you mentioned that the striatum, the hypothalamus, the basal ganglia, the cortex, these are all involved. So we're talking, so mm -hmm, for listeners, mm -hmm. there's like kind of the, the surface of your brain, the cortical levels, if you will. And then there's like the interior of your brain, the subcortical levels, the basal ganglia, things like that. And those things are usually responsible for things we don't really think about, right? Movement. I'm going to walk over to the door and open it and go out, right? Well, there's a process in the brain that is, traditionally we see that as just procedural automatic we don't think about it it's the prefrontal stuff where it's like well am i mm. going to choose this item on the menu or this one or am i going to choose to be with this person or that nothing you know it's less you know kind of the mechanics of things although you might see it differently i guess but how, how do we understand the different parts of the brain cortical or subcortical yeah. that are weighing these costs and benefits of making decisions mm -hmm. um, and how yep. does it look different i guess yeah, so um, I mean, what I wanted to do in the book is, to, is take some time to get into those details, partly because they're fascinating, um, just in and of themselves, but also, you know, when it comes down to it, those are the things that I would say we use to make decisions. Now, some people would look at that and go, oh, look at all this neural stuff is making the decisions for you. I don't, I don't buy that. Um, but what I would say is that um, I think, again, as with 
free will or agency writ large, I think the best way to understand those systems of action selection and decision making and goal selection um, are to take an evolutionary approach. So we can take very simple organisms and ask what kind of a thing are they choosing between? What Even just like what actions can they do? Right? So for a bacterium, the action is rotate my flagellum, this outboard motor, clockwise or anti-clockwise, and that will make it move one way or another. Right? Sure. Um, for, say, something like a C. elegans, a simple nematode, um, like I said, it's, it's responsive to chemicals and to touch from things in the environment that it bumps into or that bump into it. Uh, but it has very simple behaviors. Basically, it moves forward or it moves backwards or it wags its head around or it makes it turn. You know, it's a very simple repertoire that's controlled by this set of what are called command neurons. So the command neuron, when it fires, basically says, release this behavior and inhibit all the others. So for a worm, if it's going to go forward, it has to not go backwards. Yeah. Right, so part a big part of doing something is not doing anything else at the same time. So a lot of the systems that we have, that all organisms have for action selection, are actually inhibitory. They're mm -hmm. preventing you from doing all these actions except one. Right, right. Right. They release right. one, mm -hmm. and so the choice often for a worm is, uh, you know, you've got these competing possibilities: move forward, move backwards, and there's some sort of uh, circuitry that compares, say, signals from the nose to signals from the tail, the level of aversion, the level of attractive stimuli, has a few, a few kind of layers that do this kind of cal calculation, if you will, um, a utility function of whether it should move backwards or forwards. And then the output of that is to say to one of these command neurons, you go, you don't go. And when the command neurons go, the actual motor behavior, they don't have to tell the muscles how to do it. Mm -hmm. They just tell it to do it, right? Yeah, you just yeah. do that, go forwards, right? And I, I, a lot of the things that we do are like that too, right? When I want to take a drink of, of water here, I don't have to tell my muscles how to do that. They know how to do that, right? There's a motor action that I can just pursue. Right. So um, with that logic, you, you can understand a lot of even much more complicated behaviors. So you can get to organisms that have you know, they have a much more complex behavioral repertoire especially things with 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 limbs for example mm -hmm. they don't it's not just that they can move they can locomote in the world forwards or backwards they can do things with their hands or with their mouths you know whatever those kinds of things right they can act on things in the world without having to just move in the world so the scope for action becomes much bigger that means that the cognitive apparatus for choosing between those things has to become more sophisticated as well. And then you want to know, well, that has to be informed by reasons for doing things. And the reasons are, well, at least two different things. One is what's out in the world. And two is what's my internal state. Mm -hmm. And the internal state bit, we haven't really talked about much yet, but that's what provides the motivations for doing one thing versus another. Mm -hmm. Right? So you may be hungry when you see some food. If you're hungry, you may say, I should eat that. Or if there's no food around, you may say, I should look for some food. Right? And if you, uh, you, know, you might go to, go to a restaurant or you might call for food, whatever it is. Right? So there's a drive to get food if you don't have it. There's a drive to eat food if you do have it. And, no, but in another circumstance, right, you just had a big meal. You, you don't want to get a steak. Right? You want to do something else. So the motivation for that behavior is lower. Uh, and I think that can manifest in two ways. First, the idea. It just won't occur to you to go for a steak after you've just had a big dinner, right? So the idea just doesn't pop into your head. And we talked about this a little bit before of ideas popping into our heads. They do pop into our heads, right? But not completely arbitrarily, sure. right? When you're hungry, the idea of going for food pops into your head. That's a good reason, right? You have a reason for that idea to pop into your head. Okay. Um, now, the other way it will um, come into your sort of decision-making process is once some ideas pop into your head of things that you could do in a certain circumstance that are, you know, they may be prompted by you're having a goal, they may be prompted by certain motivational state, and they'll be prompted by what's out in the world and what you know about it and what you can do about it, okay? So even already, there's a whole load of processing happening that can be subconscious, but that's still you, that's still yeah. you making some informed decisions, right? Okay, 
So there's an idea then that there's this whole circuitry. It goes from the cortex down to the basal ganglia. It involves signals from the midbrain and the thalamus and hippocampus, all tectum, all loads and loads of areas, right? It's a very distributed holistic process yeah. where basically you, you, the system can compare these options. Say it's got A, B, C, and D, right? And it sort of sub subjects them to this evaluation process where in a sense, you could say the organism is simulating the outcomes of an action. So it's a, if I did A, what would the outcome be? And then is that a good outcome or not? And so there's systems that involve dopamine and serotonin and neuromodulators that are kind of used as evaluation signals. They're used for what's called reinforcement learning as well, which is this mm -hmm. mechanism that guides behavior through time. But in a, in a moment, Terry sort of thing, they're, they're used to up, up or down weight one option versus the others. So there's this ongoing competition. Only one, only one can be released, right? It's like the command neurons in, mm -hmm. in a C. elegans. It's only possible for one of them to be released at, a, at once. Um, so only one of those actions can be released. And all the others must be inhibited. While you're doing that evaluation, you're sort of inhibiting all of them mm -hmm. until, until one of them wins. And that's that process of deliberation, really. Um, that's choosing, yeah, okay, this is a good thing to do in this scenario. Sometimes it's completely habitual. You already know. The system's yeah. totally configured in a way that says, this is, there's a habit of thought mm -hmm. and there's a habit of action that you just execute without having to think about it. Other times, yeah, you're not so sure, right? You're going to weigh up some options. Uh, there isn't a right answer. You just have to kind of satisfy over, over all these constraints that are um, po possibly conflicting. Um, and then other times you just really won't know what to do, uh, but you still have to do something. So, um, yeah, so all of those systems are, are operating. Those are the mechanisms by which we make decisions and choose actions. Now, what I will say is that there's levels to that, right? When I, when I talked about taking a drink and making a motor action, I could decide, reach your arm out and take, you know, take a drink, right? I'm deciding, first of all, to do the the action of reaching, but I've already decided to do a behavior, mm -hmm. an activity, mm -hmm. not an action, an activity, take a drink, right? And I've decided there's a goal there. Mm -hmm. I should take a drink. I want to take a drink. So I, I think of it as this sort of nested um, decision-making where you're choosing some goals and activities and agendas and commitments and projects that may persist for some period of time. Within that context, those are giving some constraints that are informing mm. choices of current behaviors. And then the execution of those behaviors, you're going to choose a way to do it, right? I could pick that up, this water bottle with my left hand or my right hand. It doesn't matter that much, right? I'm still doing the same behavior. I'm just doing a different motor action. So, um, so that gets back to this idea of organisms not just making this binary decision in the moment, but guiding their own behavior through time with these sustained agendas um, that enable them to be be predictive, right? I mean, they're 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 predicting the outcomes of things way in advance. And how can I get it? They don't have just a goal to say, I I want to get food. I want to eat food. That's my goal. Well, there is no food, right? So you have to drive to the restaurant. So you have to drive for half an hour. So for half an hour, you have to sustain this goal uh, and the behavior that's going to allow you to achieve it. Um, so, so for me, that nested view is a much better, clearer way of thinking about mm. behavioral control than just these binary decisions. Yeah. So, like with movement, right? So, movement's obviously is terribly complicated in uh, in, uh, in in the human brain, uh, in one sense. So, like if you think of like, there's a certain kind of order here. So, like there isn't this kind of choosing agentic kind of thing in the cerebellum necessarily, right? There's a goal, there's a behavior, okay, we're going to go, we're going to do this. It's in collaboration, obviously, with, you know, the basal ganglia. Again, for listeners, basal ganglia is in the kind of, you know, very, you know, center part of the brain. It's very deeply nested. And I always learned that uh, um, basal ganglia was like the executive functioning of movement. So planning, sequencing, organizing mm. of, of mm. movement. Um, and, you know, that's coming from the frontal lobes of I'm going to make this choice. I'm going to, you know, pick up the cup with, you know, drink a glass of water, raise it to my face and drink it, you know, et cetera. There's, you know, obviously there's lots of movement going on in, in your hands and your joints and your fingers, the fine mo motor movement, gross motor movement, et cetera. 
you're not saying that there's choice in you know so cerebellum is the kind of like control and regulation of movements in the back yeah, of the head yeah. so the, the mini brain or whatever all of these things all of these parts are collaboratively working based on the choice made in you know let's say prefrontal cortex or somewhere else mm-hmm. that there's a kind of not that it's deterministic but that there's you know each and again i should clarify the brain does not have all of these specific parts only. There is memory and learning in different parts. There's movement in different parts of the brain. It's it's all connected all together. But there are some concentrated areas, of course, for some things. You're saying all of that together. All of that yeah. together for a particular choosing. Yeah. Do I pick up the glass with my right hand or with my left hand? That's the action. The The, the processes of doing that might necessarily not have at each step of the way in the details some kind of choosing uh, more so what's the the ultimate behavior goal is, is that right yeah well they've got control right so so throughout the those kinds of behaviors the organism exert is exerting sustained control mm-hmm. now sometimes there are moments where it's really deliberating between one or two things right uh, I just think that to purely focus on those misses the the huge picture of this sustained um, sustained control. Yeah. So when we think about the you know the brain, I want to want to ask one one piece here about um, <laughs> it's it's a very interesting piece about <laughs> it, we're getting more and more abstract here. So I want to talk about ACC and creativity because you talk about that mm-hmm. and this idea of freedom of choice. Um, yeah. And then also the brain as a whole, I kind of sort of alluded to it, as a whole cognitive system that operates on representations of desires, goals, and intentions. So now you're really looking at the whole brain really is, mm. is doing that. So maybe just talk about the ACC creativity and then we can talk sure. about the, 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 the goals yeah, and intentions. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean there's um, this idea that – you know, some ideas pop into your head. You're in, a, you're in some scenario, right? You, you encounter some situation. Some ideas pop into your head for what you can do. Now, some of those scenarios will be really habitual. It's just obvious what you should do. You know, someone says good morning to you. You should say good morning or hello or something back, right? You don't have to think about it. Um, but there may be lots of scenarios where um, you're not so sure about what to do, but you decide something, right? So there's a few options. You choose one of those. And then you try to carry it out, right? And, and it has a goal, right? You have a goal for doing that um, or you want to see how, it's, how it turns out as you're doing this thing, right? And, and so you have, we have systems for monitoring, am I achieving my goals, right? Was my action successful in doing whatever it was I wanted? And um, when they're not, the, those monitoring systems, excuse me, um, keep track of whether you're, you're being successful or not, or and, and they engender you know, feelings of frustration or satisfaction, depending on that. And those feelings guide behavior, right? If you're constantly being frustrated and trying to do something, well, maybe at some point, either you should try harder or you should do something else, right? And the doing something else is really interesting. So maybe you go back and say, okay, that didn't work. Uh, well, one of these other options, I should try that. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe there's a, another good option, but maybe there isn't. Right? Maybe you really actually need to go back to the drawing board and ask your guys to give you some better ideas here for what you can do. Right? So um, there seems to be a system in, in mammals and there's other kinds of systems, even in things like worms, where there's um, some mechanism to kind of inject a bit of more noise into the system that's suggesting these ideas. This is where the, the locus cerulius releases this norepinephrine, which goes to at least anterior cingulate cortex, or just part of the cortex near the midline, that, that is in some sense responsible for monitoring these goals and then suggesting things that you can do. That's a very simplified, crude way of putting it. Um, but the basic idea is that it kind of raises the temperature of the search space. So when, uh, instead of sort of falling into a, an easy rut, right, these few simple ideas that occur to you most readily, it shakes it up, right? It shakes up the system so that it, it, it can jump out of those what we call a, a local minimum uh, into some new, some new territory. It can expand the search space and come up with some really novel ideas that you hadn't, you know, hadn't thought of before at first, at first blush. 
Um, I think that's a really interesting kind of phenomenon that cannot, in a sense, explain creativity. And I don't just mean like, you know, artistic creativity. I mean like problem solving creativity, where you're frustrated by something, yeah. you can't figure a way out. And then you realize, you know what, shit, I should just do this completely other thing. Yeah. Out, outside um, the box. Let's just do it completely. Outside the right. box. Right, right, right. Exactly. And so I think it's fascinating that there's mechanisms that have evolved you know, specifically to do that, in a sense, it's an example of the organism using the indeterminacy in the system, right? There's some noisy neurons. Most of the time, that noise is being, sh is being corralled and buffered in a way that makes sure the organism can do what it wants. But sometimes it can take advantage of that as a resource and say, you know what? I need some ideas, new ideas, random ideas, mm -hmm. you know, constrained, not, mm -hmm. not anything, mm -hmm. uh, but a little wider search space. Um, so, uh, you know, that gets back to our uh, discussion earlier about when you don't know what you want to do, there's not a good reason to choose, you don't have enough information. Well, yeah, you can use some random sort of processes in your brain uh, to just let noise accumulate and decide the outcome. It's just more important to do something mm. than, than to spend more time trying to figure out the right thing to do. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I find that really, really interesting. Yeah, I, I do as well. I think it's one of those things where it starts to become when you're looking at the whole entity, what, where where do these things kind of, you know, kind of fall out? And we're saying we're making these kinds of um, you have these intentions, whether we know them or we don't know them. I still have this frustrating <laughs> battle of knowing if we're making a choice or not knowing if we're making a choice. Yeah. That's a that's a frustrating thing well, for me. It is, and, and, um, but I mean, you're touching on a really key point in human evolution, right? Mm -hmm. So many organisms, what I described, the system for action selection and weighting things and evaluating and biasing this competition and learning from experience, you know, that uh, what I didn't, you know, I mentioned uh, this reinforcement learning where when an organism does something and it turns out well, the next time it encounters that scenario or a similar one, that option will be upweighted, right? Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll spring to mind more readily, and when it does, it'll be evaluated more positively relative to other choices. And that, again, is this sort of behavioral control through time, right, mm -hmm. by learning and experience. Now, what we have, right, so many organisms have those kinds of systems, and they can be very sophisticated, and the, the elements that are at play there in, in the cognitive processes are representations of things like objects in the world, or, or really actually beliefs about objects in the world, mm -hmm. uh, beliefs about your own yeah. internal states, right. um, the, the motivations that those internal states uh, engender, um, knowledge and, and, and memories, beliefs about uh, affordances and what outcomes of actions and past intentions, right? All of that kind of stuff. And you could say the cognitive system operates over all of that information and suggests a good thing to do. Now, what we have seems to be an extra level or two or three or four, these extra layers to this hierarchy where I was talking about, you know, a hierarchy of, of actions and behaviors and activities and goals. Um, there's a hierarchy in the perceptual system of thinking about uh, points and lines and objects and types of objects and categories. Um, there's a hierarchy in our knowledge systems and thinking about things types of things, properties of types of things, relations between types of things, types of relations between types of things, right? So, so you can get this more, more and more sophistication of these cognitive processes. And then you get this step, this extra step, where we can think about our own thoughts, mm -hmm. right? We can not just have in our cognitive arena the representation of, uh, of an object, we can have a, a thought about the object. Mm -hmm. Right? So we've got an extra level that is kind of reflective. Right? It's looking, almost looking back down on itself, where the belief becomes an object of cognition that can be operated on. Because you can say, should I have that belief? How certain am I in that belief? Why did I come to that belief? Was my evidence good? And you can see, once you can do those things, you can see the cognitive or well, the, the control system value. Right, the adaptive value, this extra level of being able to introspect and inspect your own beliefs and desires and motivations and why they're there and the level of confidence and certainty you should have attached to them gives you in controlling, better controlling behavior. 
Because it may be something, you know, you did something, it didn't work out. Well, why was that? Maybe the information that you had, uh, may, you know, maybe you just made a wrong, bad choice mm -hmm. and you should do something else. But maybe you made a bad choice because the information you had was bad or the inference you drew was not correct. Mm -hmm. And then you need to change that. And it may be an inference about a perceptual thing. You'd say, you know what, that wasn't a, that wasn't a snake on the path after all. It was just a stick, mm -hmm. right? Um, or the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so all of those levels of metacognition and introspection that we have in humans, I think, enable this, this level that you're talking about, knowing mm -hmm. that you can make a choice being able to consciously think about our own thoughts and reason about our own reasons. So reasoning as a verb becomes a thing, right, that we can do. And we can do it individually. I think that's hugely powerful. But the real power is that we can do it collectively, right? Because we have language and communication. I can tell you my reasons for doing something. Right? I can get you to do it. I can persuade you to do it because it's a good reason or a bad reason, or it should be your reason uh, as well. Right? And, and um, so there I think you get into not just this kind of um, level of, of metacognition in individual humans, but a meta-meta level in, in social, cultural groups and collectives where human evolution really took off because of cultural evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I firmly agree. The, the metacognition stuff is always interesting, especially when you can do it with, like, fiction. You're like, Well, you know that somebody wrote this book and they wrote this character's perspective and the character's thinking about, thinking about his dream he had last night and, like, some author wrote that piece and you know that this... Yeah. There's, like, all these, like, that levels. I mean, that, that's probably the thing that separates us from, as far as we know, all, all other organisms uh, on the planet in yeah. terms of this crazy amounts of levels of metacognition. Yeah. So I want to. I mean, it becomes infinite, right? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, no, yeah, definitely, there's no limit to the scope to absolutely. the scope of that. It's yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's absolutely wild. So I want to ask you about personality. I have a feeling we mm. might uh, we might fight on this one. So this would be interesting. So I remember Good. reading the book, and I said, I'm not sure here what I think about this. But yeah, you get there's two schools of thought in personality. First, uh -huh. a single underlying trait that influences various behaviors. Uh, second. Uh, something like the big five uh, yeah. is just a statistical concept that shows variation and underlying biological parameters that influence a broad range of behaviors. Um, mm. And it sounds like you prefer the second option. So I, kind of I, ex I do, yeah. explain to us the two, these two schools of thought and I guess the differences in why you prefer this kind of second one. Shh. Sure. So, um, I mean, the reason this is, uh, you know, a topic in, in the book is because, of course, as we started, you know, saying at the beginning, the idea that we have personality traits, um, you know, really a personality trait is a descriptor of patterns of behavior, tendencies through time across contexts and situations. So if you're extroverted, that might manifest in different ways in, you know, social scenarios and work scenarios and home life and, and your behavior broadly, right? Um, and if you're neurotic, that might manifest in different ways and so on. So, so those terms um, are interesting. And in a sense, they reflect biases in decision-making, right? So if you're extroverted and I'm introverted, there's, there's biases in the way that we will tend to behave. We will, you, you might, for example, weight social interactions as more rewarding than I would. The, right. the only you're, you're not saying this, but I just want to clarify. The only difference I would make there is that with personality, in terms of using these terms, neurotic or agreeable or conscientious or whatever, using Big Five, these aren't discrete. They are on a continuous kind of spectrum here of sorts, where someone isn't only extroverted. They will be yeah, yeah. Yes. highly elevated or lowly elevated. So there will be some variance thereof. There might be some introversion that someone will have if they're extroverted. Let's say. So there will be yeah. a mix, but it will just be sure. in terms of degrees, just, just to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. Thanks. Um, yeah, I didn't want to give the impression of a binary. These are, yeah, these right. are continuant, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, uh, when we, well, how, how are these traits defined, right? Why do we talk about the big five, extroversion and neuroticism and openness to experience, conscientiousness and agreeableness? Where did, we, where did those come from? And psychologists have been working for many, many decades trying to figure out the dimensions along which humans differ in personality and how many are there, right? Um, now, in the English language, there's at least 8,000 words 
that refer to personality traits. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and the question is, well, how do they pick out eight thousand independent dimensions, or how many, right? And so you can reduce them by saying, look, yeah, extroverted, sociable, outgoing, Gregarious, ebullient, right, right, lively. Right, 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 right. They're all referring to the same thing, right. right? So you can collapse a huge number of terms into that dimension, mm -hmm. and then you can collapse like neurotic, anxious, worrying into another dimension, mm -hmm. and then you can then you can ask um, people to do, you know, on questionnaires, you can you can give people a load of questions that basically tap into these things and you can make them do a kind of a score, right? So you can get a quantitative, it's just a pseudo quantitative value for how extroverted somebody is. It's, it's not a real thing. That really is a statistical construct. Um, but it's, uh, can you I, know, can it's I, kind of re can reliable. I, can I make a point here on, on this point as yeah. well? As well? <laughs> so I will say in terms of, of, of psychological measures, uh, given through psychological assessments, there are there's at least four major kind of schools of thought in which they're used. Uh, different different ones will use different kinds of methods, and the reason why many psychologists hang a lot of weight, uh, aside from it, the studies actually do uh, replicate, which is nice. It's a big problem in psychology. Mm -hmm. They do replicate, and they do replicate cross culturally. So that's nice. That doesn't happen often and in, in, in really in social sciences in general. So that, that's very nice and it has for a long time. But the biggest thing is that the, the big five is a theoretical, which means it doesn't have a theory such as like Freud or Jung or other, these other kinds of personality theories kind of pushing it. So yeah. a theoretical means it's just trying to look at the kind of traits or principles, and there's not some bigger th uh, uh, theory behind it. Now, some people cry about that or complain about that, and there's pros and cons to it. But I think overall, if you're trying to look for some objectivity or neutrality, you want an a theoretical approach. And second to that, the there are many problems with uh, self-report measures, and many of the the, the measures of personality do. Uh, rely on self-report, which is problematic. It doesn't invalidate it completely, but there are issues with it. But with Big Five, it does use factor analysis as its main yeah. form of statistical computation, which is a very uh, you know, it's a complicated uh, statistical way of measuring uh, you know, how many variables have an underlying variable that you know, kind of connects them based on how you load them. Which is one of in, in, the, in the social sciences, factor analyses is one of the strongest for statistical sure. uh, measurement. So I just want to put those caveats in there as well because I'm with yeah. you. Self-report measures no, have their problems. So. Uh, no, I wasn't trying to say that. Actually, I mean, what I what I what I want to say is that these are statistical constructs, and I don't mean that they're not real or they're not useful or they don't tap into something okay. useful or they don't have predictive value. Mm -hmm. Okay, they do, mm -hmm. right? So the reason we use them, is, first of all, the reason we have these terms at all, these words in English language is because we do have stable patterns of behavior that are picked out by these things. Otherwise, we just wouldn't have the words for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, people do behave in slightly different ways as trends and tendencies through time. Okay, so psychologists have come up with these ways to try and measure them. Now, what I'm saying when I say it's a pseudo-quantitative thing is it's not like measuring height where there's a, there's a clear physical quantity that you can measure. This is like a response to a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. And you could have it 20 questions. You could have 30 questions. You do some mathematics on it. You get a normal distribution for all of these things, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's good, right? I mean, people at the high end of, of that distribution really are behaviorally different from ones at the low end. Yeah. And o over time, those behaviors are fairly um, robust. Those differences are fairly robust. And, and if you test people multiple times, they're fairly, you know, there's some reliability to the numbers and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question is, so when, um, first of all, you can settle on five traits that, which are kind of internally consistent and robust and stable, but they're not strongly correlated with each other, mm -hmm. right? So their neuroticism and conscientiousness and extroversion are not strongly correlated with each other. So they're useful as independent dimensions. Yeah. So you can say those five traits give me a pretty good overview of, of much of the variation in human personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, some people would say, well, no, you need six or eight or 10 or 12 or 16 or whatever it is, right? The big five is kind of conventional 
people have settled on it. So they can be used for lots of things. You can make some kind of very broad predictions across groups of people that um, track things like conscientiousness, tracking, for example, predicting um, job income, mm -hmm. right? It does, it weekly. Now, not for every individual. You don't get a very good individual prediction, but across groups you do, right? So that's why they're useful. Mm -hmm. The question is, when you make a construct like that, you measure a bunch of, you ask a bunch of questions, you attach a number to it, is, is that referring to a singular thing in the brain or multiple things, mm -hmm. right? So is it a reflection of, say for extroversion, your sensitivity to reward, right? It could be there's one thing, there's one system in the brain that's doing that, that say, you know, it's the amount of opioids or dopamine or whatever it is that's released when you, when you get a reward where, you know, someone could give you $10 and you would go, woohoo, $10, big, you know, release neurally. And someone would give me $10 and I go, eh, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay. It's not as reward. Why wasn't it $20 or why wasn't it $50? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where's my 20 What am I, chop liver? Um, I'm worth $10 to you. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So, so um, but the point is there's a different subjective experience mm -hmm. to what looks like the same uh, objective, ostensibly the same experience. Right? Yeah. Um, now, that it might be that there is one singular difference that explains how, how rewarding you find lots of different things, um, just excitement in general, social situations, uh, intellectual conversations, going out, partying, whatever it is, right? Um, and that one thing explains this extroversion and all of the ways it manifests. But it could also be, statistically speaking, that the construct that's called extroversion captures lots of independent variables that are have these sort of pairwise correlations. It's not one latent construct, it's a bunch of stuff. And that's the view that I favor. And partly... Partly it's because, well, first of all, people have looked in you know, brain imaging experiments for correlates of things like extroversion or neuroticism, right? They've looked really, really hard for functional differences or, or structural differences or connectivity differences, and they really haven't found any. There, there isn't an obvious singular brain correlate of extroversion, mm. right? However, what they do find in the brain, and this is true in humans, but even more so in animals, is circuits that mediate things like risk uh, aversion mm -hmm. or threat sensitivity or reward sensitivity or um, slightly more abstract things like delay discounting, which is a measure of how long, how much you discount a reward based on how far in the future mm -hmm. it is you're going to get it, mm -hmm. right? So if I say, I'll give you $10 in five minutes, if you do X, that's better than if I say, I'll give you $10 a week from now. Mm -hmm. And you'll mm -hmm. discount the value of that. Different people will do that differently. Right? So those are, those are circuits in the brain that people have been able to identify in animals. And you can tweak them. right? You can change the delay discounting of an animal. You can make it more impulsive or less impulsive. You can change the confidence threshold that it needs to act, but, you know, the confidence in a in a perceptual decision, say, before it will act. Um, you can change how sensitive it is to threats or rewards, and then those manifest in these big patterns of behavior that we recognize as extroversion and so on. So all I meant by, those, by, by that is that um, we can get at some circuit, circuits um, parameters that influence decision-making that I think can manifest in human psychology with the, those terms that we use as personality traits. Um, in, in animals, I think we can get to a more specific brain basis of them where we can really get in and tweak things because we have that invasive potential. Um, so yeah, so that's how I think of, of personality traits is that they're basically, they reflect kind of the neural tunings of a bunch of underlying parameters. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad I asked it. I'm glad I clarified it then. So we agree on this then. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that um, subjective experiences and or the phenomenology of humans shows that the thing we call agreeableness has a lot of other things underneath yeah. of it. And it is important. It's not that the trait doesn't exist. I think it does exist, but that there's different... Um, there could be different things loading into that. There's different ways. Yeah, there's in different which behavior facets. Manifests. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I yeah. would firmly, and, firmly and, agree with that. 
Yeah. And so two people could have the same score of extroversion. Correct. And they might have answered Correct. yes on a completely different set of questions. Correct. Correct. There, right? So it can be manifesting so, in different ways. Absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. those all I mean is those 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 um terms are kind of crude high level manifestations. Mm -hmm. They're descriptors. Mm -hmm. They're descriptors. They're not uh, expla they're not explanations. Yeah, yeah. I, I would. Right? I think I would. Uh, and so the question yeah. is, what is the what is the explanation down at a at a neural level? Mm -hmm. And this becomes right. I mean, this becomes um, important because there's a school of thought that says, look, these personality traits um, determine your behavior, and in turn, they are determined by your genetics. So you know, it, there's a. Many people look to behavioral genetics and say, look, there's a threat to free will here from behavioral genetics because it shows your, it determines your personality, which determines your behavior. So here's, here's a place where it's important to not use the word determine, <laughs> but to use the word influence, yeah, right? Yeah. So your genes do influence your personality traits. They do not determine it, right? Those traits are... 30 to 40 right. to 50 percent heritable okay. right but the rest of that variation is not genetically driven and the personality traits themselves do not determine your behavior on a moment-to-moment -moment basis they inform how your behavior emerges over your lifetime and that's a very different view that is less like saying i'm just a robot that has these certain tunings right now therefore i will behave in this way because i sense this reward and this risk and this is my you know these are how my circuits are firing mm -hmm. okay so i'm glad you brought this up because i did want to this dovetails into the next question so this idea of the self um so obviously mm -hmm. character temperament personality these things are we can you know splice hairs all day about those things but they're they're i think they're Different, but I think that they have a lot of overlap. But the question mm -hmm. I want to know, and I think this is what I mentioned earlier that we agree on. So I had this converse. I have had two conversations with Brian Lowry. He's a social psychologist, I believe. Yeah, out yeah. in uh, Stanford. Mm -hmm. Great guy. He's got a great book called Selfless. Um, we have a a standing disagreement um, on the self and you folks can listen to really the second conversation I had with him. But, uh, we talked about a little bit at the end of the first conversation and he, he goes full social constructionist and says that the self is just whatever you want it to be. You can be a different self. It's how you, it's how, how you identify is, I hope I'm getting this right. How you're is mediated by how people receive you and how, how, how your yeah. social considerations are received. Now, that's important because, I mean, we don't deny that the, the self is not mediated by social constructions of, of, of a sort or social influence. This is, again, a, a part of the environment. But the, 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 the main argument we have, we still have to this day, is um, it's a, fun, it's a fun, fun argument, it, which is I think that there's something um, constant or stable mm -hmm. That makes us who we are that we call the self. Now we him and I both agree, and I think you'll probably agree. There's no there's no person inside of me pulling the levers that you know, there's a yeah. passenger yeah. that I, I don't believe that. Uh yeah. he doesn't, I don't think you do. So we get that. The self is a, a, a whole constructed whole, like all of me is mm -hmm. the self. But what I my position on this is, you know, who I am at five. And who I am now is there's a lot of change that has happened, but at my core, there's enough of me to be me and only me. It cannot be yeah. that changeable because then yeah. it legitimately, no one would recognize me. People wouldn't recognize yeah. who I am. And I, you and I, and I, you. and it wouldn't be me. Now he yeah. believes that he's like, well, yeah, people just call those souls. You believe in a soul, you just don't call it that. I was like, no, 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 it's not a soul. I don't believe in a soul. I don't believe in this idea of, no. he's like, well, if you think it's just something about you that means encapsulated in this like kind of uh, uh, ca capsule, that's mm. usually how people think of souls. But so what? But it doesn't have to be encapsulated, but, right? It can be a persisting right, like distributed it can, pattern. It can be embodied. It can be, right. It can be all these things. So here is the point. This is a, I, I'll see if I can remember this example. People can listen to the conversation. I, I said it better then. But, you know, I see it as, I think, uh, genetics are super important for understanding who we are. I think mm -hmm. the elements of our biology help us understand things. You can have a car, let's say. And you can say, okay, you know, there's, you can have different passengers in the car. 
you can have a different color of the car, you can have all of these things, but there are a, a wheel, there's four tires, there's a body that makes it a car. It has to be a car. Mm-hmm. You could have different changes to things. And I think that for us, um, the things in, in when we're thinking about who it is to be a self, I think genetics play a part. I think so, certain elements of temperament, certain things of how we understand certain things like, of the big five. I think those things can be relatively stable and constant through time. And I root it in a kind of biological basis. I, I don't, that's not to say the environment isn't important for influencing and in, in changing aspects of the self, but mm-hmm. elements of who I am um, at my core, there's a, there's a constancy. For me, I, I said this in that conversation, you know, if you ask my mother how I was at four or five years old, I'm still the same way in a lot of ways. Now, mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. could just think that I'm terribly regressed or something. <laughs> I haven't matured <laughs> over 30, 40 years or whatever it has been. Mm, but sure. like, no, that's not the case. It's, it's that there's enough that says, you know, people could know me 20 years ago and yeah. they could see all the changes. You know, I, I don't have, I'm bald now. I have a beard, you know, maybe I'm, you know, 15, 20 pounds bigger, whatever, whatever. But it's still you. Yeah. And to me, it's that constancy, which has a lot of biological bases. So in terms of selfhood and how you think about the self, how do you usually kind of think about this or, or answer this? And how much is it, can it change or not change? Yeah. Well, um, so first of all, I think I uh, agree with you strongly. But I, I, I will say that I've heard Brian um, Lowry talk on a few different things. My understanding of his position was in terms of the sort of the psychological, biographical self um, – was that that was kind of entailed by your social relations, right? And the social Sounds social right. ro- the social roles that you have as a as a father or a, your whatever job you have, yes. or a, a brother or a husband or a son or yes. or a friend or and, and all of these things. So you've got this your your sort of social self is 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 just entailed by that network of relations, yeah. and I think that's fine. And I don't think that means it's inconstant or not persistent because that network of social relations you know does mm-hmm. persist through time it uh, i mean it's unusual for that to completely blow up and change you know from one day to the next mm-hmm. right so there is some there is some persistence there and you know more generally what i would say is that i would define the self first of all as you have said it's not a little being sitting no. inside somewhere <laughs> no. right and i would say it's not something generated by the brain as, or produced by the brain, um, I think it's something entailed by the brain, right? And I, in the same way that I think of for a bacterium, its self is entailed by all of the processes that are ongoing, and the entailment arises by its continuity through time, right? In an instant, there is no such thing as a self. It's just a concept that doesn't apply. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything to be a self in an instant, which is why I think the idea of decision-making in an instant and what the self is doing is just a misconceived Mm -hmm. question. It's just a wrong way to frame it. The whole point of a self is that it persists through time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the actions that we take um, are designed to further that persistence, right? It's your, right now, you are being informed by your past self that learned a bunch of stuff mm-hmm. that's guiding your actions in service of your future self. Mm-hmm. So there's a through line there where the self is only uh, real in terms of temporal extension. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. In an instant, there is no such thing. It makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Now, all of this, I think, ties back to this idea of focusing more on this temporally extended guidance of, of behavior as opposed to these momentary decisions, right? Um, okay, so so that's the first thing about selves. The, the other thing is, okay, well, what's, what makes yourself the way it, it is, right, as opposed to another possible way? So we've got some continuity through time, but why is it continuity of this pattern as opposed to that pattern? And we've got, you know, we've got physical bodies that are the way they are because of uh, genetics and development and uh, our, our experiences and so on. And we have our psychology that is also partly due to genetics, um, partly actually just due to evolution, in fact, largely due to evolution. We, we tend to focus, you know, behavioral genetics focuses on these, these differences between people and people get all sort of uh, head up about them. 
Those are tiny. Those are tiny, tiny little differences. We're all human beings. You know, do you think if a, an alien came down and started uh, watching us, they'd go, ooh, look at this one. He's spicy. You know, think, no, that'd be the way that we look at mice. They're all the same, right? Um, so, so there's human nature uh, that isn't, a, it's a constraint, right? I mean, people talk about freedom wanting to be completely unconstrained. Well, what would that even mean? It would mean not being a self, mm -hmm. right? Because being a self, acting in, the, in a consistent way through time so as to further your own persistence means having human nature. It means having your individual nature. It means acting on the basis of your memories and learnings from all the experiences that you've had. And, and by the way, they're, they're not just things that happen to you, right? They're things that you were actively involved in choosing. Mm -hmm and creating all along. So the idea that we're just configured now by factors that have happened to us that were out of our control, I think is only true if you think you never have control, right? That's a sort of a circular argument. If you think you're an agent that can make choices, well, a lot of those choices shape our experiences, select our environments, create our environments, uh, and, and um, you know, ultimately feed back onto our characteristic adaptations. So when we think about the way that we behave, you know, I was saying it's not just these little tunings of your personality traits, it's everything you know about the world, all these habits and policies and attitudes and dispositions that you've developed through time by interacting with the world, coming to adapt to it uh, and shaping it as you want it insofar as you can, all of those things manifest as, as character traits, really. Um, and as attitudes and dispositions that inform your decision-making through time. So um, I think all of that, if you stripped all of that away and you say, no, I don't want any of those constraints. I want to be absolutely free from any prior cause whatsoever. Well, fine, but you're not going to be you. There's no you left. All those constraints, you just are a bundle of constraints, mm. right? To be a self is just to constrain all the stuff that you are uh, to stop it from being not you right? <laughs> through time. Like, so, so it's, a weird, um, it's a weird argument to me to frame the idea of free will as this absolutist thing because there is no self that could have that and, and still be a self through time. I have one last question that could be uh, two hours by itself. So I, uh -huh. I, I'll, I'll ask you for the, I guess, the abbreviated version because I, I, I recognize it is a, uh, a tough one. Um, this idea of, of AI. Um, yes. Uh, and, and not just machine learning. So not chat GPT or things like that. I, I, when I think of, you know, artificial intelligence, I think kind of a little bit more in the future of kind of like in a Westworld idea. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the show touched on ideas of free will and the term, you know, if you have absolutely uh, a, a, a humanoid kind of um, entity that, you know, is very much simulating humans, you know, what is it, what does it look like in, I guess my, my question here is, is when we think about machine learning or AI, how do we deal with this idea that there could be some element of free will of choosing mm -hmm. <laughs> which could be really harmful for us as humans so what is <laughs> so we've talked about free will in other organisms and other animals yeah. hu obviously free will in humans but you know in the in the next iteration of this if we have machines or humanoids or robots or ai that have this free choice. It's not just like binary, you know, mm -hmm. ones and mm -hmm. twos or zeros and ones rather. What, the, what could that mean? What, what are your, what are your thoughts yeah. on, on some of the dangers of this? Well, first, um, I think we have to ask, could, could we build that, right? Is there something yeah. so yeah, yeah. special about us, um, or other animals that couldn't, you know, that we just couldn't recreate in a, in a, um, non-biological system. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see any reason in principle to think that there is. I think there's some 
architectures that we can understand. Um, there's some configurations and systems mm, yeah. that we see organisms are using. They're taking sensory information in. They're managing a bunch of different goals. They're choosing between a repertoire of, of actions. Um, they're doing that in, in a sustained way through time. There's nothing in principle that says you couldn't build complicated robots that can do those kinds of things, right? Um, the question is, what would you need to, in order to do that? What do they need to have that they currently don't have? Yeah. And they currently don't have any reason to care about anything, mm. right? They're not embodied. They're not, uh, they're not precarious in the way that living organisms are. They don't have to work to stay alive, right? They're, they're not a locus of concern. Um, so, but they could be. Right? I mean, you could make an, a robot care about the integrity of its own components. Mm -hmm. You could give it some signals that say, oh, mo my components are not working well. I need to repair this. I need to get the raw materials to do that. I need to, my fuel sources are low. I need to get fuel um, and, and so on, right? There's no reason why you couldn't do that. Um, and there's no reason why you couldn't build systems that are, that are capable of artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. Where I think you know, I talk uh, think about that in terms of goal-directed sense making and problem solving. Right, that's what I think is a manifestation of general intelligence, generalized across novel situations. That's the hallmark, right? That's the payoff uh, for intelligent uh, for intelligence is intelligent adaptive behavior. Current. AI systems like machine learning systems just aren't configured to do that, right? It's not a failure. They're just it's not their job to do that. It's not in the design, right? And they don't generalize well, partly because they don't have to make these abstractions we were talking about before where they're, you know, finding causal relations between things and trying to understand what those are in the service of being able to exert causal power in the world in an adaptive way, right? They just don't do that. But if you made them embodied in some way and gave them some goals, some master sort of utility functions, they might be able to learn how to do that. Um, if you made them a locus of, of concern that way. And then there are all these sorts of ethical questions, practical questions, but also lots of ethical ones. Um, like what would, would, what kind of an entity would that be? Would it be deserving of some ethical, uh, moral consideration? Um, you know, if not, why not? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, these are questions that relate to how we treat other animals and all sorts of other things as well, right? We currently already have these issues, but if we create artificial life, we will additionally have some responsibilities um, there towards it. Now, um, let me say one, one other thing in passing. We can worry about these sort of existential risks and long-term risks. I think there's a whole bunch of risks about AI currently yeah. that that, that need to be considered um, that aren't these science fiction scenarios. Mm -hmm. They're just like the YouTube algorithm, mm -hmm. th those kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Okay. So that having said that, um, it's still interesting, I think, to think about these other issues. And um, yeah, my view, uh, like I said, I don't see any reason in principle why we couldn't build an artificial intelligence. And I said, I, I mean an artificial intelligence because I think it would have to be an entity. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have to be an agent. And I think it would have to be alive. Mm. And so, um, yeah, to get true intelligence, I think it would have to be a, effectively a living agent. Mm. Um, so, so there now, yeah, there you're into a whole mm -hmm. load, load of, yeah. of tightly linked questions, but that's really what the book is about, is about that linkage, the relationship between agency, intelligence, cognition, and ultimately consciousness and, and mm -hmm. choice and free will and control. Um, so yeah, it's super fascinating. I mean, my own, uh, I'm really interested in it myself more as a test bed for thinking about the, these, testing these, these theories of what these configurations are, are for, but um, you certainly want to think carefully before actively constructing anything Absolutely. that might have its own agency. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I firm, uh, that's exactly where I fall in as well, is there's a lot of, a lot of caution uh, if you don't know what something could be. So the last question I have for you is, you've written a, you a, 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 a book that is, is so uh, wonderful, um, and it will get a lot of people hopefully talking, both uh, hating and, and loving it, So, for, which is good. I think that's great. I guess the question is, you, what's your two-minute spiel on, hey – 
this is what the book's about. Here's why I think free will exists, and here's why evolution helps us explain it. Like, what's that like two minute kind mm. of like boom? Here it is. Uh, maybe in, in in defense of free will or against determinism or however you want to frame it. But what's that like two minute kind of way you summarize it? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I would I'd start with the phenomena that we want to explain, right? It seems like we make decisions. It seems like other animals make decisions and act in the world as causal agents. So we can see that there's some challenges to that, like from physics and neuroscience and so on. And we can take those challenges and just say, well, I guess, you know, the world is deterministic and all those things are an illusion. Or we can say, well, those challenges are pretty stern to how could we meet those, right? The, the, in a way that actually um, does explain these phenomena without explaining them away. And that's what the book tries to do. And the evolutionary approach is really um, to try and ground the concepts that we need to understand the complicated manifestations of these abilities in humans in the simplest organisms we can think of, because it's really tied to life. I mean, life is an ongoing activity. It's a set of processes that, these, you know, the, the, that are holistic, where the organism itself uh, is trying to persist through time. Right, and, and succeeding by doing work. So, you know, we can see the origins of action right there. We can see persistence of a self. We can see an entity that has some causal power as, an, as a whole thing, not just being pushed around by its parts. So I think taking that approach, we get, um, I hope, uh, an antidote to very reductive mechanistic views that eliminate um, the self, that eliminate um, our ability as a whole human being to make decisions and instead say, look, it's just your brain doing it or it's just physics um, doing it or it's just your pre-configured circuitry. So um, the hope is it's, it's a naturalistic uh, framing that avoids either the, the sort of uh, what I take to be a kind of absurd determinism or uh, this mystical kind of dualism and lands in a place that I think is biologically reasonable um, as an explanation for for these capacities, perfect. That's fantastic. That's that's really great. Uh, so the the book is called Free Agents: How Evolution Gave Us Free Will. This is uh, through the wonderful Princeton University Press. And uh, any place in particular that you want people to to find yourself or any of your work? Oh well, um, I uh, I have a website kjmitchell.com. Um, I'm on Twitter a lot uh, at Wiring the Brain, and I have a blog um, which is also called the Wiring the Brain blog. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, look, uh, it's always so much fun, Kevin. I enjoy talking to you. I, I, I've been I've been wanting to talk to you for for quite some time again, and, and the new book gave me a great excuse, and it was it was uh, not disappointing in the least. And uh, yeah, two, well, two and a half hours is is, is so so generous. So I, I really I really do appreciate okay. it. Oh, it's really my pleasure, Xavier. It's also um, great questions, you know, great pushback. And, and um, I, well, I appreciate the opportunity, but I also appreciate the, you know, digging in a little bit and the opportunity to get into it. Yeah, so, yeah, it's absolutely. It's been so much fun. Big, big thanks. All right. Okay.